Preface of Mary's Grammar, interspersed with stories and intended for the use of children. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Jennifer Dahlman. Mary's Grammar by Jane Marset. Preface I have so often pitied children who have been studying a grammar which they did not understand, that I thought I could not do them a better service than endeavor to render so dry and abstruse a subject easy and familiar. In the elucidation of the first elements of grammar, I hope my attempt has not entirely failed. But had I been aware of the metaphysical difficulties I should have to encounter in a further development of the subject, I do not think I should have undertaken the task. It is true that the consideration of such difficulties seldom occurs to the minds of children, and may, perhaps, without inconvenience, be disregarded in a work intended for them alone. They form, however, an insuperable obstacle to my rendering this little work as clear and intelligible as might be wished, and will, I trust, afford some apology for its imperfections. The stories have been introduced with a view of amusing children during the prosecution of so dry a study, but they may occasionally be used with advantage as parsing exercises. End of Preface Chapter One of Mary's Grammar by Jane Marset. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Jennifer Dahlman. Part the First Nouns Lesson One. A little girl was sitting one day with a book in her hand, which she was studying with a woe begotten countenance, when her mother came into the room. Why, Mary, said her mother, what is the matter? You look as if your book were not very entertaining. No, indeed, it is not, replied the child who could scarcely help crying. I never read such a stupid book. And look, she added, pointing to the pencil marks on the page, what a long, hard lesson I have to learn. Miss Thompson says that now that I am seven years old, I ought to begin to learn grammar. But I don't want to learn grammar. It is all nonsense. Only see what a number of hard words that I cannot understand. Her mother took up the book and observed that the lesson marked out for her to learn was not the beginning of grammar. No, mamma, the beginning is all about letters of the alphabet and spelling, but I am sure I know my letters, vowels, and consonants, too, and I can spell pretty well, so Miss Thompson said I might begin here, and she pointed out the place to her mother, who read as follows. There is in the English language nine sorts of words, or parts of speech, article, noun, pronoun, adjective, verb, adverb, preposition, conjunction, and interjection. When she had finished, Mary said, Well, Mama, is not all that nonsense? No, my dear, but it is very difficult for you to understand, so you may skip over that. Let's see what follows. Mary seemed much pleased, and her mother continued reading. An article is a word prefixed to nouns to point them out, and show how far their signification extends. Well, Mama, that's as bad as the rest, and if it is not real nonsense, it is nonsense to me at least, for I cannot understand it, so pray let's skip over that too. Let us see if something easier comes next, said her mother, and she went on reading. A noun is the name of anything that exists. It is therefore the name of any person, place, or thing. Now, Mary, I think you can understand that. What is your brother's name? Charles, replied Mary. Well then, Charles is a noun, because it is the name of a person. And am I a noun as well as Charles, Mamma? I is not your name, replied her mother. When I call you, I do not say, come here, I. Oh, no, you say, come here, Mary. Then Mary is a noun, because it is your name. But sometimes you say, come here, child. Is child a noun as well as Mary? Yes, because you are called child as well as Mary. And when I am older, Mama, I shall be called a girl and not a child. And is girl a noun too? Yes, every name is a noun. Then Papa is a noun, and Mama is a noun, and little Sophie is a noun, and Baby is her other noun, because it is her other name, and John and George. Oh, what a number of nouns! Well, I think I shall understand nouns at last and her countenance began to brighten up. 
there are a great number of other nouns said her mother sheep and horses cats and dogs in short the names of all animals are nouns as well as the names of persons but the grammar does not say so mamma it is true replied her mother that it does not mention animals but when it says that a noun is the name of everything that exists animals certainly exist so they are included well i think mamma the grammar ought to have said persons and animals or it might have said animals alone for persons are animals you know mary oh yes i know that men women and children are all animals and they are all nouns as well as geese and ducks woodcocks and turkeys oh and my pretty canary bird too and i suppose the names of ugly animals such as rats and frogs and toads and spiders are nouns also certainly replied her mother but look mary the grammar says that the name of a place is also a noun what place mamma all places whatever a town is a place that people live in yes said mary so london and hampstead and york are nouns but a house is a place people live in too mamma therefore house is a noun as well as town what is this place we are now sitting in called mary it is called a room so room is a place to sit in and stable a place to keep horses in and dairy a place to keep milk and butter in and they are all nouns and cupboard is a noun mamma because it is a place to keep sweetmeats in certainly replied her mother then the house and the garden and the church and the fields are nouns what great nouns exclaimed mary and our little places nouns certainly this little box is a place to hold sugar plums therefore box is a noun and the keyhole of a door is a place to put a key in so keyhole is a noun and drawer is a noun i am quite sure mamma for it is a place i keep my toys in but mamma i think the keyhole of a lock and the box for sugar plums are more like things than places they are both but things that are made to hold something such as a drawer and a box may also be considered as places especially if they are made for the purpose of keeping the things they hold in safety oh yes said mary papa's desk is a place where he keeps his letters and bills so carefully you know mamma i am never allowed to touch anything in it then there is the tea chest which is a place and a thing too it is a very pretty thing and a very safe place for you know you always keep it locked oh i began to like nouns they make me think of so many pretty things i'm glad to hear it my dear said her mother but i think we have had enough of them to-day you must not learn too much at once or you will not be able to remember what you learn we shall find enough to say on nouns for a second lesson continuation of nouns lesson two the following day mary came skipping into the room with her grammar in her hand well my dear said mother i'm glad to see that your face is not quite so long as it was at the beginning of your last lesson oh no mamma said mary it is quite a different thing now that you talk to me about my grammar and explain it so nicely i do not promise you mary that it will always be entertaining we cannot learn without taking pains but if you understand what is taught to you the pains are not very painful she said smiling well you have now learnt that nouns are the names of persons and of places but the grammar says that they are also names of things oh yes i understand that without any pains at all mamma do pray let me tell you what things are nouns i hope you do not mean to name them all said her mother for as you know that everything is a noun you would never have finished oh no replied mary i cannot name everything in the whole world only some of those i know best table is a noun and chair and stool and my doll and my toys too but mamma she cried suddenly interrupting herself if everything is a noun what can the other parts of speech be everything is a noun my dear but not every word the words for and pretty for instance are not nouns no said mary for the words for and pretty are neither persons places nor things so they cannot be nouns well but mamma if i were to teach sophie grammar i mean when she's a little older do you know how i should set about it no indeed i cannot guess said her mother laughing but i should be very curious to know what new method you have discovered after such a profound study of grammar as you have made nay mamma do not laugh at me said mary half vexed 
well come tell me what your method is why then i should tell sophie that a noun is the name of everything and then it would be done at once for when she knew that everything was a noun there would be nothing more to learn about it your method said mother is the most simple and correct but do you not think that if she had learnt it thus all at once she might forget it all at once also do you not think that all we have said about nouns and dividing them into classes of persons places and things has helped to imprint them on your memory so it has mamma i should not have remembered half so well what a noun was if we had not talked of so many and found out whether they belonged to persons places or merely things oh mamma she continued looking out the window there is a noun called a carriage coming trotting down the hill so fast does the carriage trot my dear oh no i mean the horses but you know they are nouns too as well as the carriage horses are nouns because they are the names of animals and a carriage is a noun because it's the name of a place or of a thing she said interrupting herself but it is certainly not the name of a person but said her mother there are some persons in the place perhaps yes said mary a carriage is a place that holds people not things like a box or drawers i think i may have seen things in a carriage mary ay and felt them too very inconveniently when we go into the country and it is full of packages but what is there in this carriage i cannot tell yet mamma it is too far off oh now i see a gentleman and a lady and they are nouns because they are persons but i cannot see inside to know whether there are any parcels and do you hear the sound of the carriage wheels yes that i do she replied it makes a fine noise coming trotting on at such a rate well then noise is a noun for whatever you can hear see taste smell or feel is a noun and you can hear a noise mary looked astonished then mamma she said nouns are not only things of all kinds but other words besides for noise and sound are not things at least not common things that we can see and touch such as chairs and tables that is true said her mother they are of a different nature but they are still things do you not say a loud noise is a very disagreeable thing a sweet sound is a pleasant thing these nouns are certainly rather more difficult for you to understand than those which you call common nouns but you must take pains to remember that whatever we discern by any of our five senses is a noun our five senses repeated mary those are seeing hearing smelling tasting and feeling and by what sense do you discern those nouns which you call common such as tables and chairs why we see tables and chairs and we can touch them too if we please so we know them by two senses seeing and feeling and we discern the sound of a noise by the sense of hearing then said mary thunder is a noun because i can hear it and lightning is a noun because i can see it and you are a noun mamma over and over again for first you are a person then i can see you and feel you when i touch you and hear you when you speak but i cannot smell you her mother then took out a handkerchief and mary exclaimed oh i can smell you now so sweet and she jumped up on her mother's lap to smell the perfumed handkerchief i hope you're not going to taste me mary said mother drawing back and laughing her mother then told her that a noun was often called a noun substantive what is that inquired mary everything that exists replied she is a substantive but you will understand that better by and by their attention was then caught by a carriage stopping at the door oh mamma cried mary they are getting out it is uncle and aunt howard i am so glad and uncle and aunt are nouns and i hope the little nouns are come too you know what i mean mamma emily and mary we must go and meet them said her mother mary ran on first and arrived at the door just in time to receive them End of chapter 1chapter two of mary's grammar by jane marset this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by jennifer dolman pronouns lesson three well mary said her mother the following day what difficult lesson of grammar have you to learn now oh my grammar is not half so difficult as it was mamma replied mary or as you thought it was my dear 
yes but indeed it was very difficult till you explained it to me but let me see what comes after nouns and she read a pronoun is a word put instead of a noun to avoid the too frequent repetition of the same word i do not understand that at all mamma i will tell you a story that will make you understand it mary's eyes brightened at the thought of a story but her mamma told her it would consist of only a few phrases to explain the pronoun there was a little boy and the boy climbed the tree for the boy wanted to gather some cherries so the boy laid hold of the branches but the boy was so busy gathering the cherries that the boy lost his hold so the boy fell to the ground and the boy was very much hurt what a number of boys you have said mamma observed mary and yet there was but one and is it not tiresome said her mother to hear the same sound so often repeated yes why do you not say the boy climbed the tree and he gathered cherries and he fell down and hurt himself so then you think it would be better to put he instead of boy to avoid the too frequent repetition of the noun oh yes now i understand it boy is a noun and he is put instead of the boy and that is instead of a noun so he must be a pronoun and are there a great many pronouns mamma not so many as there are nouns for he will stand for other nouns besides a boy look at that man yonder he is whistling to his dog what is the word he put for there mary oh he is put instead of man the dog follows him mamma he is very obedient so then he will do for boy and man and dog too very well i am glad to see you understand it now can you tell me what pronoun you would use for that little girl with the blue bonnet that you see walking yonder oh what a pretty blue bonnet she has mamma well you have said the pronoun without thinking of it did i said mary surprised what was it you said she has a very pretty blue bonnet ah so i did she is the pronoun put instead of the little girl and will not she do also for the lady who is with the little girl just as he stands for both the man and the boy do you think she is her mamma whose mamma my dear the little girl's mamma and why did you say her mamma instead of the little girl's mamma oh because it's much shorter and easier to say her than to say little girl over and over again ah now i guess why you smile mamma her must be a pronoun for the little girl as well as she so then there is more than one pronoun for the little girl yes replied her mother there is more than one pronoun for one noun but then on the other hand the same pronoun will stand for a great many nouns yes as he stands for man and boy and dog and she stands for both lady and little girl you said just now i am very hungry who does i mean it means me mamma and who does me mean why your little mary you know mamma well then i and me are both pronouns which you say instead of mary when you speak of yourself but little sophie does not know yet what pronouns mean and she says give sophie some bread sophie is very hungry ah so she does said mary because she has not learnt grammar but you used pronouns before you learnt grammar mary mary was a little puzzled to know how she could use pronouns without having learnt them at length she said i knew what i and me and she and her and him meant though i did not know that they were pronouns and that they were used instead of nouns well sophie does not even know what i and me and she and her and him mean so she does not use pronouns yet and when will you teach her mamma she will learn it as you did by hearing pronouns frequently repeated she will at last find out what they mean now tell me when i speak to you what do i say instead of mary you say dear child sometimes and do i not often say you i say are you tired of walking will you sit down so when you speak to another person the pronoun you is used but when we talked about the little girl with the blue bonnet we said she not you because we talked of her we did not speak to her if we had spoken to her we might have said you have a very pretty bonnet is that lady your mamma 
now mary can you find out a pronoun that will stand for both the little girl and the lady at the same time oh no mamma that must be very difficult for the lady is a great woman and the little girl is quite a child they are so different that i cannot conceive how the same pronoun can stand for them both them both repeated her mother who do you mean by them i mean the lady and the little girl oh dear them is a pronoun for them both and i said it without knowing it look mary they are just going out of sight so we can see them no longer and she laid an emphasis on they and them to show that those two words were pronouns how funny it is mamma said mary that one pronoun should stand for two nouns at once do let me try if i can find an example then after thinking a few moments she exclaimed with exultation as if she had made a great discovery look at those sheep mamma they are feeding in the field here is a box of sugar plums may i taste them see mamma what a number of nouns i have made the pronouns stand for all the sheep and all of the sugar plums but the sheep and the sugar plums make only two nouns my dear what do you mean mamma don't you see how many sheep there are in that field and then the whole box is full of sugar plums all the sheep replied her mother are sheep and sheep is one noun or one name for those animals we see feeding then all of the sugar plums in the box is one noun also and in the multiplication table i believe mary that twice one are two mary laughed and her mother continued now the lady and the little girl are two different sort of nouns yes said mary they are not just alike as the sheep are and the sugar plums are but cannot one pronoun stand for a great many different sorts of nouns certainly look at the nosegay i gathered this morning there are roses jasmine pinks carnations and a variety of other flowers they smell very sweet and their colors are very bright her mother then gave her a piece of cake and told her she might go and play in the garden as her lesson was now over how nice it is said mary tasting the cake then she cried out oh mamma i have found out a pronoun all alone not a pronoun that stands for a great many nouns but only for one single noun not for a person nor a place but a thing you may guess it mamma and she laid a slight stress upon the word it to help her mother to guess right it replied her mother mary laughed and thought her mother was very clever to guess right so easily she then ran on with a string of examples here is my book shall i put it by and where is my bonnet i must put it on and my tippet i must fetch it so it stands for book and for bonnet and for tippet and it may stand for everything that is not a person or an animal it is often used for animals also said her mother especially for small ones look at that bird how fast it flies and that caterpillar how slow it crawls the bee a fable from pignati the next morning when mary brought her grammar her mother said no my dear we shall not go on any further to-day i will read you a little story and you shall afterwards look out for all the nouns and pronouns in it that is called parsing oh how i shall like that said mary a story and nouns and pronouns too how funny it will be to find them out it will require more painstaking than you perhaps are aware of but for now the story there once was a little girl girl said mary that is a noun and what did the little girl do she was playing alone in a pretty garden she was very young and ran over to the bed of flowers and rolled on the grass filling her hands with daisies what a number of nouns and pronouns too said mary half to herself but go on mamma i will not interrupt you again all at once continued her mother the little child as she was lying on the grass heard a buzzing noise over her head and looked up and saw a large yellow and purple bee the sun shone upon its wings and made them shine bright as gold and she thought it was the most beautiful insect she had ever seen the bee whirled round and round her several times as if at play and every time it approached her she stretched out her little hand to catch it 
but it was all in vain and at length the bee flew far away the little girl got upon her feet as fast as she could and ran after the bee which flew about above her reach until it was weary and then it settled to rest on a beautiful full-blown rose when the child saw it remained quiet she went up to the rose bush as gently as possible treading softly on tiptoe and when she came within reach she suddenly stretched out her hand and grasped hold of the bee and the rose together the bee angry at being thus disturbed thrust out its sharp sting and pierced through the skin of the poor little hand that held it the wounded child screamed with pain and the mother hearing her cries ran to her assistance she took the sting out of her hand bathed it with arquebusade and when the child was a little recovered from the pain and fright her mother said my dear child do not seize hold of everything that looks pretty without knowing what it is for there are many pretty things that would hurt you mary was so much taken up with the child's suffering that she quite forgot the nouns and pronouns and when the story was ended her mother desired her to read it over attentively and to find out the nouns and pronouns it contained mary made out above thirty nouns and nearly as many pronouns but she did not go through the whole story at once her mamma divided it into three parts and mary did it at three different times which made it easier for her End of chapter two chapter three of mary's grammar by jane marset this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by jennifer dahlman adjectives lesson four the following morning mary came running into her mamma's room with her grammar in hand as usual well mamma what am i to learn to-day she said i begin to like my grammar and observing her mother smile she added yes indeed really and especially now that there are stories belonging to it i'm very glad to hear it answered her mother to-day you shall learn what an adjective is pray explain it mamma for it is a very hard word let us first see what the grammar says about it mary and she read an adjective is a word added to a noun to express its quality as a good child a pretty toy oh but mamma i do not know what to express its quality means you must tell me all about it or i shall never understand it can you not explain it by some little story i do not mean quite a whole story but something like a story that always makes me understand it you mean by example i suppose said her mother well let me think when i walked out this morning i saw a pony cantering along the road what sort of pony was it mamma was it a little brown pony like coco no my dear it was a pretty spirited gray pony but larger than coco now your grammar says that an adjective expresses the quality of the noun the quality means what sort of noun it is the pony is a noun cannot you tell me what sort of pony it was that i have been describing you said mamma that it was a pretty gray spirited pony larger than coco well then pretty gray spirited and larger are adjectives for they are qualities of the noun pony and serve to distinguish it from other ponies if when you ask me what sort of pony it was i should reply it has four legs with hoofs and a head would that satisfy you no indeed for all ponies have legs and hoofs and a head so i should not know what sort of pony it was if you made such an answer well then you see that it is necessary to find out something that distinguishes one pony from another such as being gray and pretty and to give you an idea of its size by saying that it is larger than coco distinctions of this kind are called qualities but mamma there are many other ponies that are pretty gray and larger than coco that is true and the pony i have seen is one of those the adjective does not point out qualities which distinguish one pony from all others but qualities which distinguish some ponies from other ponies but suppose said mary the pony had some quality so very strange that no other pony in the whole world was like it suppose it had wings that would distinguish it from all other ponies i should then call it a monster mary and not a pony for no pony has wings 
cato our black dog must be an adjective mamma because black distinguishes him from dogs of another colour no dog you know is a noun but black is an adjective put before the noun to show one of its distinguishing qualities thus blue is an adjective put before your frock to show what is the colour of your frock and in the evening white will be the adjective of my frock mamma because you know i wear a white frock in the afternoon and are pink and yellow and all colors adjectives yes and not only colors but every word that shows any quality of the noun for instance you are a little girl oh yes said mary little is an adjective because it shows what sort of girl i am but i shall have another adjective when i am older it will be a great girl and i hope you may add a good girl said her mamma then for if you are attentive to your lessons perhaps you may have the adjective clever joined with your name oh mamma exclaimed mary suddenly look at that naughty kitten she has been playing with my new ball of scarlet worsted and spoiling it you have just said three adjectives said her mother try if you can recollect them mary thought a little while while she wound up the worsted which she had saved from the claws of the kitten and then said naughty kitten new ball and scarlet worsted well mamma i do think everything is an adjective you made the same observation upon nouns mary and then you were right for things are nouns but there is not a single thing that is an adjective true said mary if it is a thing it must be a noun and the same word cannot be both a noun and an adjective too no replied her mother kitten ball and worsted are nouns and the adjectives naughty new and scarlet describe the qualities of those nouns the lesson finished here for mamma declared that there was yet enough to say on adjectives to occupy them another morning lesson five the next morning mary came running into the room holding a new box in her hand look mamma she said what a pretty box i'm going to give to sophie and she laid an emphasis on pretty to show that she understood it was an adjective it is indeed said her mother but yet i think my work-box is prettier oh to be sure mamma but then the new box aunt howard gave me is the prettiest of all so then mary one box is pretty another is prettier and the third is prettiest and are all of these pretties adjectives mamma yes when you allow that my box is prettier than the box you hold you compare the two boxes together do not you certainly replied mary and when i say my new box is prettiest i compare it with the other two boxes though it is not here then you can easily understand why the adjectives pretty prettier and prettiest are called degrees of comparison oh yes because the three boxes are compared one with the other look at this large book mamma said mary taking up one from the table but there is another still larger i can hardly lift it it is so heavy now i must look over all the books to find the largest and then i shall have the three degrees of comparison now let me compare something that is little here is a little key on your bunch of keys mamma i do not think it's a very small one my dear no but then you know i want to find a littler and littlest to show the degrees of comparison but mary in this case you should not say littler and littlest but less and least ah so i should said mary i thought littler and littlest did not sound right in general if you add the syllable er to the adjective it gives you the term of comparison as tall taller small smaller and when you add the syllable est it gives you the other degree of comparison as tall tallest small smallest but there are many exceptions to this rule yes replied mary for i could not say little littler littlest for the keys but i might have said small smaller smallest suppose i were to say you are a good child mary what are the terms of comparison for good i do not know for you cannot say gooder and goodest i am sure no replied her mother but think a little and you will find them out mary was puzzled at last she thought of some good cake she had eaten the evening before when she had been to play with her cousins 
and then some cake she had eaten at home which she liked still better and then she exclaimed oh now i have found it out good cake better cake and best cake those are the three degrees of comparison and mamma added she i dare say that you will find out that i shall be a good girl a better girl and a best girl at last i shall be very glad if i do said her mother smiling but tell me did you eat much of this good cake with your cousins i believe i did mamma but charles ate more oh i am afraid charles was a little greedy boy said her mother no it was harry who was the greedy boy for he ate the most of all ah those are the three degrees of comparison much more most i ate much cake charles more and harry most the degrees of comparison in adjectives of more than two syllables said her mother are usually formed by the addition of the words more and most for it would be tiresome to lengthen out the words that have already three or four syllables thus if you say an agreeable woman you cannot say an agreeabler woman or an agreeablest woman no indeed replied mary that would sound very disagreeable but you may say a more agreeable woman and a most agreeable woman and you may say a sensible man or a more sensible man and a most sensible man now said her mother i will tell you the names of these degrees of comparison the first is called positive if i say this fire is hot i mean that it is positively hot but if i say the fire in the dining room is hotter then i compare the fire in the drawing room with the fire in the dining room and therefore this degree of comparison is called comparative but where shall we find the hottest fire in the house mary oh in the kitchen mamma where the cook roasts the meat and dresses all the dinner well then the kitchen fire is hottest and hottest is called the superlative degree which means that it is above the others but mamma when you said this fire is hot you did not compare it with any other fire so how can hot be a degree of comparison what you observe is very true mary correctly speaking the positive adjective is not a degree of comparison i will now write down a few of these terms of comparison and she wrote as follows positive comparative superlative rich richer richest wise wiser wisest large larger largest nice nicer nicest new newer newest and pray mamma said mary write down some of the adjectives you cannot put er and s to you know what i mean you mean replied her mother when it is necessary to change the word in order to express the degree of comparison then she wrote positive comparative superlative good better best bad worse worst little less least much more most and there the lesson ended end of chapter three chapter four of mary's grammar by jane marset this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by jennifer dahlman articles lesson six at the next lesson of grammar mary's mother told her that there were only two more words to be learned which relate to nouns and these were the articles a and the they are what the parts of speech begin with in grammar said mary here they are she added opening the book and reading an article is a word prefixed to nouns to point them out and to show how far their signification extends as a house an orange a man and you may recollect mary that you begged to skip the articles over to which i consented as i thought them too difficult for you to begin with but now that you have learnt three of the other parts of speech i think you will easily understand what an article means i will try mamma if you will explain it but a is not a word it is only a single letter that is no reason why it should not sometimes make a word of itself the pronoun i is only a single letter but that letter makes an entire word true said mary i never considered that i was only one letter i suppose because it is a great letter and so it looks more like a word by itself great or small makes no difference my dear it is the sense and not the size or the sort of letter that you must think of 
the article a is a capital letter when it begins a sentence as a man came here but it is a small letter if it comes in the middle of a sentence as give me a shilling now let us consider the sense or meaning of the articles and the difference between a and the suppose the gardener were to come in and say a tree has blown down in the garden i should not know which of the trees had been blown down oh mamma cried mary eagerly i know what you would do you would ask the gardener about its adjectives to know whether it was a large or a small tree or young or old or pretty or ugly but that would not satisfy me said her mother i should want to know not only what sort of tree it was that was blown down but which particular tree it was and adjectives will not always tell me that mary was disappointed that she had not guessed right and she said then mamma you only need to ask him which tree it was and he might reply said her mother the great tree that grew on the bank so you see the points out that one particular tree that has blown down whilst a merely states that it is some tree or other without saying which but mamma the would not show you which tree was blown down until the gardener told you that it was the great tree that stood on the bank that is true my dear the does not tell you which tree it is but it tells you that the explanation is coming for whenever the article the is used some account or description is sure to follow the sense is not complete without it and if the gardener said the tree i should not understand him but when he adds which stood on the bank the meaning is clear yes said mary i understand suppose i were to say pray mamma buy me a doll i should mean any doll you liked but if you took me to a toy shop i dare say that i should ask leave to choose it and i should say pray buy me the doll with the pretty blue eyes that open and shut very well said her mother the would point that you wished to have one particular doll and pretty blue eyes would show me which one it was oh yes said mary the pretty blue eyes are the adjectives i mean pretty and blue for i know eyes is a noun and these adjectives help distinguish the doll from the others so you see mamma the article the will not do alone to show which doll i wished for no replied her mother the article the only points out the particular doll the description of which immediately follows and in the description adjectives nouns and all sorts of words may be introduced the article a continued her mother can be used for nouns of the singular number only you cannot say a houses a flowers oh no said mary laughing but you may say the house as well as the houses the flowers as well as the flower so the is both singular and plural or at least said her mother the can be used for nouns either singular or plural whilst a can be used only before a noun singular because a means one the is called the definite article because it defines or points out the particular object which is afterwards described as in the instance the great tree that grew on the bank a is called the indefinite article because it does not define anything or point out any particular object mamma will you give me a apple said mary that is the indefinite article but do you think that sounds right mary no i think i ought to say give me an apple but is an an article yes when the noun begins with a vowel as apple does the article a must be changed into an merely on account of the sound for the meaning is the same you know which of the letters are called vowels oh yes a e i o u and y well then think of some noun that begins with a vowel and see whether you must not change the article a into an before it mary thought a little and then said egg begins with a vowel so i must say an egg not a egg and you must for the same reason say an elephant an ox an ass an ape an orange but there is another case in which an must be used instead of a it is when the noun begins with an h which is not aspirated you know what aspirating the h is oh yes replied mary and she repeated horse hand heart you always make me aspirate the h's when i read mamma not always for they should not always be aspirated in the word hour the h is not aspirated nor in the word air or honor therefore you say an hour an air an honor but not a hour 
a heir a honour oh no cried mary that would sound very bad the continued her mother never changes because the hour sounds as well as the horse though in hour the h is not aspirated and in horse it is then mamma after all there are three articles instead of two a an and the i have no objection to you considering them as three different words but it appears to me that as a and an have exactly the same use i should call them the same article and can a and the be put before pronouns as well as nouns inquired mary no my dear you cannot say a he the she and it that would be quite nonsense articles continued her mother can be placed only before a noun or before an adjective which is followed by a noun a pretty a hard the high the blue is nonsense but a pretty flower a hard stone the high hill the blue sky is sense you can understand the meaning of each of those phrases clearly oh yes they are very short said mary only three words in each an article an adjective and a noun and those three words make sense then mamma if i wanted to know whether a word were a noun or not i have only to put an article before it and see whether it makes sense or nonsense if i put a before tall i know that tall is not a noun because a tall is nonsense but if i put a before man or house i know that man and house are nouns because a man or a house is sense that is very true mary but i think it is a still better method to know whether a word is a noun or not by understanding its meaning i think we may now take leave of articles and conclude our lesson for to-day but mamma you will tell me a little story will you not that i may find out adjectives in it that will help me remember them very well replied her mother but then you must find out not only the articles but the nouns pronouns and adjectives also i will read you this story to-morrow for you have had quite enough grammar to-day the hens and chickens a hen who was confined under a hen coop in the poultry yard had a large brood of young chickens i believe there were no fewer than twelve of them they were so small that they could get in and out of the coop between the twigs of the wicker work but the hen was too large to get out and she was sadly afraid of her little chickens running away and being lost so when they went out of the coop she called after them as you have heard hens call their chickens cluck 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 and when the chickens heard her they ran back into the coop she sometimes picked up grains of corn to give them to eat and sometimes she nestled them under her wings and kept them as warm and snug as if they had been in a nice bed one day the hen saw a large hawk flying high in the sky she knew that it was a bird of prey that is a bird which seizes on little birds and carries them away the hen was terribly frightened lest a hawk should pounce down upon one of her little chickens seize it in its sharp talons and carry it away so she kept calling out cluck 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 as loud as she could and the chickens came running into the coop one after the other as fast as their little legs could carry them they all got safe in and hid themselves under her wings except one little chicken which had strayed so far from the coop that it could not hear the hen call it it had been playing about with some ducklings and when the mother duck called her young ones the little chicken went with them to see what they were going to do the great duck was not kept under the coop like the hen but she waddled about wherever she chose and the little ducklings followed her she led them to a pretty little round pond in the poultry yard and when she got to the edge of the water she stepped in and began to swim then the little ones all followed her into the pond and the poor chicken was quite frightened for she thought they would be drowned but to her great surprise they began paddling about in the water with their webbed feet and could swim almost as well as their mother then the little chicken thought that it must be very easy to swim and it looked as if it were very pleasant so she resolved to follow her little playfellows and into the pond she went she tried to move her legs as she saw the ducklings do but it was all in vain she could not swim and when she found herself sinking in the water she fluttered her wings but that would not do either she could not fly then she struggled to reach the edge of the pond but her feet no longer felt the ground and she was very near being drowned 
helen a little girl who lived at the farmhouse to which the poultry belonged took great pleasure in going every morning after breakfast to feed the poultry with the crumbs of bread she had gathered from the breakfast table she went first to the hen coop to see the brood of young chickens who were just then her favorites and seeing the hen appeared much ruffled and the chickens crouched closely under her wings she inquired of betty the dairy maid what was the matter oh miss helen said betty there has been a hawk flying over the poultry yard which has terrified all the poor creatures but what is worst of all i fear that it has carried off one of the little chickens for i have just been counting them over to see if they were all safe and i can find only eleven the tears rushed into poor little helen's eyes but her mamma who was with her said let us search everywhere to see whether we cannot find it helen that would be much better than crying so they hunted all through the hen-house and under some faggots of wood and a litter of straw in short all over the poultry-yard till at last they came to the pond it is no use looking there said helen for chickens cannot swim however as her mamma went on helen followed and when they were close to the water's edge what should they see but the poor little chicken whose strength was almost exhausted still faintly struggling to get out oh there it is indeed mamma cried helen gasping for breath between delight and fear her mother seized hold of a wooden shovel which happened to lie on the ground and pushing it into the water under the chicken brought it safely ashore helen hugged it in her arms though it was wringing with wet and carried it into the house where she dried its feathers warmed it well and then gave it some crumbs of bread to eat i need not to give it any water mamma for i am sure it has had enough of that and i dare say the mere sight of water would frighten it but i believe the crumbs frighten it too for see mamma it will not eat the best comfort you can give the poor bird helen said her mother is to take it back to the coop it will recover more quickly under its mother's wing than anywhere else helen longed to nurse the chicken a little longer but when she found she could not make it eat she carried it back to the poultry yard and put it under the coop the hen was happy to see her safe back she stretched out her wings for her to nestle under them then she picked up some grains of corn which she gave her to eat and the poor chicken was so glad to get back to her mother after all the fright she had had that she thought she would never leave her any more now mary said her mother this story is a great deal too long for you to find out the nouns pronouns and adjectives it contains in one day i advise you to divide it into portions of six or eight lines and make each of them a separate exercise of parsing End of chapter four Chapter Five of Mary's Grammar by Jane Marset. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Jennifer Dolman. Chapter Five. Verbs. Lesson Seven. There had been no lesson of grammar during the whole week, in order that Mary might have time to fix in her memory what she had already learned before she began anything new at length she brought her exercise and showed her mother that she had gone through the whole of the story of the hen and chickens and had found out in it the several parts of speech she had learned her mother then thought it time to proceed to the verbs mary accordingly fetched her grammar and her mother read as follows a verb is a word which signifies to be to do or to suffer i cannot understand that at all said mary with a long face you will like the verbs that do something best said her mother so we will begin with them come here mary and as mary approached she added well what are you doing now i am going to you mamma as you desired me then going is a verb and how do you go you see mamma said mary smiling i am walking and is walking a verb too yes certainly then mary began to run now i am doing another verb she said run must be a verb also and presently she ran out of the room her mother wondered what she had gone for but she soon heard her coming back with her skipping rope and when she came in she skipped very lightly around the room looking all the while at her mamma and smiling as much as to say you see i know that skipping is a verb too when she reached the door off she went again but soon returned with her hoop which she trundled around the table very well mary i see that you understand that to skip and to trundle are verbs 
but if you run away every time you find out a new verb we shall not get on much so now sit down on that chair mary seated herself and her mother asked her what she was doing then nothing at all mamma i am sure i cannot be doing a verb now for i am sitting quite still but there are some still quiet verbs mary as well as busy active ones when you sit down you do something for you sit besides you were speaking to me and speak is a verb also mary began laughing oh what a number of verbs there are she said to laugh is another verb said her mother and sometimes a very noisy one so then you may do a verb said mary without moving about if to sit and to speak and to laugh are verbs yes and you may do a verb as you call it even without the slightest motion of any part of your body for the actions of the mind are verbs as well as those of the body so to think to hope to fear to wish are verbs as well as to ride to walk to eat and to drink while i was working this morning mamma i was wishing that my cousins might come to-day and hoping that they would and thinking all about it but it seemed to me that i did not do anything but work your body did nothing else but your mind was active as you describe and your thoughts mary are part of your mind then verbs not only express the actions of the mind and the body but their state or manner of being such as being hot or cold or being hungry or tired or being pleased or vexed well i am sure i am always either being a verb or doing a verb for i am always busy about something unless i am tired or sleeping and those you know are being verbs then mary verbs do not only express the action or being of men women and children but of all animals and all things as the sky is bright the flowers are faded the nut is cracked your frock is torn indeed mamma said mary looking anxiously at her frock i did not know it where is it the rent will soon be mended said her mother smiling it was only a make-believe example of the state of your frock oh mamma there is one verb i want very much said mary i am so hungry to be hungry is a verb it is true replied her mother but to want to be hungry is not very pleasant in my opinion oh no mamma the verb i want is to eat i rather think that you would like a noun substantive to eat said her mother giving her a slice of cake mary began eating and between the mouthfuls she said now i have got the noun and i am doing the verb having finished she complained that the cake had made her thirsty that is one of the still quiet verbs she said but i should like to do one of the more busy verbs with a noun mamma can you guess what i mean i think i can you want to drink some water indeed how cleverly you have guessed it to drink was the verb and water was the noun i must tell you now mary said her mother that there are three different sorts of verbs called active passive and neuter i know what an active verb means cried mary it is a busy verb when you are doing something active like that bird yonder look mamma how fast it flies i am sure to fly must be an active verb no my dear an active verb means not only that you do something but that you do it to somebody or to something else when i say i love i mean that i love somebody or something else do i not yes mamma you love me but when the bird flies his flying has nothing to do with any one else yet mamma you sit there quite still while you love me how can that be an active verb i think when i love you mary so my thoughts are active though i do not move however if you wish for something more active come here and she gave mary a kiss to kiss is an active verb because you must kiss some person or thing now mary if you are not satisfied added she laughing i can strike you and you will think that active enough and she gave mary several little taps oh yes i understand it mamma 
though the bird moved so fast when it flew along it did not meddle with anybody or anything in flying so to fly is not an active verb now can you tell me said her mother when willie flies his kite is it a verb active or not mary was puzzled she pondered a little and then suddenly exclaimed oh a verb active to be sure because he does not fly like a bird but he flies his kite and that you know is making something else fly so to fly a kite must be an active verb though to fly is not her mother now told her that she had learnt enough of verbs for one lesson and that they would go on with them at the next continuation of verbs lesson eight when mary came with her grammar the following morning her mother told her that the next sort of verb was called a passive verb which means she said that instead of doing anything yourself something is done to you if you say i am beaten it means that someone beats you while you remain passive indeed mamma cried mary i should not remain passive if i were beaten i should run away as fast as i could and off she ran so close to the fire that her mother called out take care mary if you go so near the fire you will be burnt can you tell me what sort of verb to be burnt is that would be something done to me mamma for i am sure i should not do it myself it hurts so it would be something not somebody that burnt me for it would be the fire that burnt me but i suppose whether it is a thing or a person does not signify no said her mother it makes no difference what it is that acts upon you to be burnt to be beaten to be scolded are all passive verbs i think passive verbs are very disagreeable said mary one has nothing to do but remain quiet and suffer something to be done to you no said her mother that is not necessary if you were burnt you would probably scream out for help and run away but unless you extinguished the flames so long as you were burnt by them the verb would be passive when you are acted upon you are considered as passive whether you remain quiet or not to be caught is a passive verb whether you struggle to get free or not to be thrown down is a passive verb though you are certainly in motion whilst falling but you are put in motion by some person or thing acting upon you and making you fall oh yes said mary but if i throw myself down it is an active not passive verb yes because you are in that case both the person who acts and the object acted upon but all passive verbs mary are not disagreeable what do you think about the verb to be loved oh that is very pleasant but mamma i thought you said the verb to love was an active verb to love is an active verb replied her mother because you love another person therefore you act upon another person but to be loved is when another person acts upon you you may say i am loved by sophie well then i should love sophie in return in that case said her mother you would return to the active verb to love in the passive verb you cannot act nor even move unless you are moved like a log or some other inanimate being as when you are thrown down or you may be pulled or pushed or driven or drawn but the instant you move of your own accord the verb is no longer passive to be admired to be praised to be caressed are also agreeable passive verbs yet i like the active verbs the best mamma because i have something to do myself then said her mother you will like the third kind of verb which is called the neuter verb for there you not only do something yourself but you do it by yourself without acting on anything else what like the bird that flew mamma exactly to fly is a neuter verb and so is to walk and to run let me think of some neuter verbs mamma to cough to sneeze to sit to stand to sleep must all be neuter verbs for when i do those verbs i do not meddle with anybody or anything else true said her mother but now mary we have been talking so long about verbs that i think we must go into the garden to refresh ourselves so run and put on your bonnet 
mary was soon ready and they went out look at that snail mamma said she how slowly it crawls to crawl is a neuter verb i remember that but i will make it go a little faster she gathered a twig and touched the snail with it the snail drew in its horns oh poor little snail said her mother do not hurt it indeed i did not hurt it mamma it is only frightened to be frightened is a passive verb for the snail is passive while i frighten it but she added if i say i frightened the snail that must be an active verb true because you act upon the snail to frighten is an active verb because you must frighten some one but to be frightened is a passive verb because the frightened creature is passive yes but mamma the snail when it was frightened drew in its horns then it became active for to draw in your horns is an active verb then mamma the snail is both active and passive at the same time for i am sure it is frightened when it draws in its horns it is active replied her mother in the verb to draw in its horns and passive in the verb to be frightened mary's attention was soon called off by the sight of a man beating a dog oh mamma she exclaimed look at that naughty man i am sure to beat is an active verb see how his arm moves and what blows he gives the poor dog who stands quite passive i wish mamma continued she that when we go in you would write down some active and some passive and some neuter verbs as you did the degrees of comparison of the adjectives and when they returned to the house her mother took a pen and wrote as follows active passive neuter to love to be loved to dance to hate to be hated to rise to lay to be laid to lie to send to be sent to sit to tease to be teased to stir to bid to be bidden to run to tell to be told to leap why mamma cried mary the active and the passive verbs in this list are all the same i do not mean the same verbs but the same things that is generally the case said her mother reflect a little and you will find it so if you love there must be some object to be loved you may love sophie or you may love strawberries or you may love pictures the active verb you know means that there is some object to be acted upon sophie strawberries and pictures are the objects you act upon while they being loved form the passive verb oh yes to be sure said mary i did not think of that if i tease somebody there must be somebody to be teased you mary who tease are the active person and call the agent of the verb and the person who is teased the object of the verb try to remember those distinctions there is a great deal more to be learnt about verbs my dear but i think you have had enough of them for the present oh but a little story at the end mamma you will not forget that now i shall have five sorts of words to look out for nouns pronouns adjectives articles and verbs very well mary i will write you a story for to-morrow the fisherman a fisherman and his wife who were very poor lived in a little hut by the side of a river they had two children jack a stout lad eleven years old and jenny who was only eight the fisherman had a boat in which he and his son used to go to the river to lay their nets when they caught plenty of fish they were very glad because they took them to the next market town and sold them for several days the fisherman had caught but very few fish and when he had but few fish to sell he could get but little money to buy food for a long time the family had nothing but bread and potatoes for dinner and the poor children longed for a little meat and some milk for their bread at breakfast one day the fisherman in drawing up his nets felt that they were very heavy well we have caught a fish or two at last he said come jack lend us a hand to heave in the nets this was soon done when to the surprise of both father and son only three fish were found in them one of them it is true was very large but it was still more remarkable for its weight why one would think this fish was made of lead said the fisherman there must be something inside when the fish was dead he ripped it open 
and what should he find instead of lead but an old purse full of gold well good luck has come at last cried the fisherman this money is just in time to pay my quarter's rent but here's enough to last for years and i promise you a new suit of clothes jack and there's enough to buy a new gown for jenny too father is there not ay and for your mother and all they hastened home with their newly found treasure and the wife was no less pleased than they were but she could not help saying what a sad thing it must be to the poor man who lost it poor man repeated her husband i think he must be a rich one to have so much gold ay while he had it she replied but now that he has lost it he must be poor mayhap he may have a deal more said the fisherman however there is no finding out whom it belonged to once so now it belongs to me who have fished it up i wonder how it got into the river cried jack and how the fish came to swallow it said jenny for gold is not good to eat no but it will buy many things that are replied her father and i promise you a rare dinner to-morrow what do you say to a beefsteak pudding and a pot of ale they counted over twenty guineas the fisherman's wife rubbed them as bright as she could and put them into her husband's leather and purse and she gave the old purse which was quite worn out to jenny there were two metal rings or runners to this purse and little jenny tried to rub them bright as her mother had done the guineas when the dirt and rust were rubbed off she saw that there were letters engraved on the runners and she took them to her brother who could read a little he examined the letters a long time and at last made out these words mr cullen heath lodge good heavens exclaimed the mother this purse belongs to mr cullen and we must restore it she added with a heavy sigh but father found it said jack and if he had not fished it up mr cullen could never have had it that don't signify replied her mother whatever is found must be restored to the owner if you can find out who he is the fisherman agreed with his wife they regretted very much all the good things they had intended to buy with the gold but it was settled that the next morning while the fisherman went to draw his nets jack and jenny should carry the gold to heath lodge which was about two miles off the next morning away they trudged and as they went they talked of the number of things they could have bought with so much gold if father had kept but one of the guineas it would have bought us new clothes and one good dinner at least said jenny and i think that would have been but fair as he found the purse father knows best replied jack and he said that it would not be honest to keep back a single penny but that perhaps the gentleman would make us a present for taking back the money oh i dare say he will cried jenny what do you think he will give us indeed i can't tell said the lad but mind you don't ask for anything look yonder's the house now take care to behave yourself jenny and make a low curtsey as soon as you see the gentleman when they were shown into mr collins room jenny dropped one of her best curtsies jack took off his hat scraped his foot and then holding out the purse there's your purse sir said he father found it inside of a fish mr cullen was astonished at the sight of his purse it is no less than two years he said since i lost it it dropped into the river one day when i was rowing and i never expected to see it again the purse is spoiled it is true but there is every guinea in it safe the runners are not spoiled said jenny for i rubbed them bright and so jack read your name you are very good children said mr cullen and i thank you for restoring my purse jack made his bow and was going away but jenny was so much disappointed that mr cullen had made them no present that she burst into tears what's the matter my dear said mr cullen oh nothing at all sir cried jack come jenny don't be so silly she is only crying about the new gown father had promised her and the beefsteak pudding and ale for dinner ay and father can't pay his rent neither sobbed jenny willing to defend herself from being thought guilty of selfishness and why not inquired mr cullen oh sir because he is so poor when he found this purse he thought the money was all his own till i rubbed the runners bright and jack read your name upon them and then he said it would be dishonest to keep it that is very true said mr cullen you did quite right to bring back the purse 
tell your father that i shall go and see him to-morrow morning to thank him for restoring the money jack again made his bow and jenny dropped her curtsey with as good a grace as she could when mr cullen chucked her under the chin and smiling archly said beefsteak pudding was it lassie would not beefsteak pie do as well jenny could not understand what he meant but thinking his joke rather ill-timed replied pettishly we shall not have either sir they then trudged home in sober sadness the following morning mr cullen did not fail to keep his promise of calling at the cottage of the fisherman and after thanking him for his purse inquired particularly into his circumstances and in what way he might be of service to him he learnt that the ill success of fishing which had brought the fisherman into distress proceeded in great measure from the badness of his nets he declared he spent all his spare time in mending them but they were so completely worn out that it was almost labor lost mr cullen then asked the dame what it was she was in most need of she thanked his honor and said she had a fine large pig which would serve them for bacon throughout the winter if she could buy meal to fatten and salt to cure it but she had not money for either mr cullen then turned to the children and inquired whether they went to school no said the fisherman though they have a mighty desire to go for some of their playmates go to the school but i have not the means to send them for it would be as good as cheating my landlord to pay for my children's schooling whilst i cannot pay my rent well do not let that disturb you my good friend said mr cullen you owe your landlord nothing the fisherman stared when mr cullen continued i learnt from little jenny there that you were at a loss for your rent and i sent and paid it this morning you are rent free to this time twelve month then if your children will attend school diligently i will pay their schooling what say you said he addressing himself to them oh i shall never fail answered jack unless father wanted me to draw the nets but i could lend a hand at that between school hours jenny was vastly pleased but looked at her mother who answered for her that she would be very regular in her attendance for she added though it may give me somewhat more to do at home i am sure in the end it will answer better for myself as well as the girl that she should be a bit of a scholar no one knows but those who can't read and write what a thing it is to have a child that can why even the little that jack knows is of great use to us you see sir added the good woman with a great simplicity it was jack found out your name on the runners of the purse then sir it is a mighty savings to have one's clothes mended neat and strong we can botch them up after a manner but the girls at the sewing school would be ashamed of such work why they would set you in a patch that you shan't be able to find out mr cullen then took leave and said that they should hear from him again the next day accordingly the next day a cart of mr collins drove up to the cottage door and a variety of things were brought into the house first there was a sack of meal to fatten the pig and a bag of salt to cure it then came a large beefsteak pie and a small barrel of beer the children's eyes sparkled with pleasure but what was their delight when two parcels were opened in which they found a complete suit of clothes for each of them the man who drove the cart bade jenny observe that the close straw bonnet and the warm cloth cloak were for her to wear in cold weather to go to church and to school jenny who dearly loved a little finery jumped about for joy lastly there was a package of new nets for the fishermen in short there was not one of the family who had not cause to rejoice and to be grateful to mr cullen for the kind return he made them for their honesty the school was a source of great improvement to the children the fisherman and his wife worked hard to do without their aid the pig was fattened and in due time salted and the fish when once in the net finding no holes in it through which they could escape were brought safe ashore and by their sale afforded the family a comfortable maintenance End of chapter five Chapter Six of Mary's Grammar by Jane Marset. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Jennifer Dalman. Adverbs. We now come to the part of speech called adverbs. Can you guess what that means, Mary? Adverb. 
repeated mary thoughtfully that must be something added to a verb so i suppose it's like an adjective added to a noun to show what sort of noun it is something like replied her mother but not quite for the adverb does not point out what sort of verb the verb itself shows that if you say i dance or he strikes the sort of action is described by the verb itself without any adverb being joined to it then what does an adverb show mamma several things replied her mother in the first place it shows the manner of the verb you can read mary but in what manner do you read oh mamma i hope i can read well now that i am seven years old then well is an adverb added to the verb to read i do not say that it is one which always points out your manner of reading for sometimes you read carelessly ah mamma cried mary that is an adverb too and sometimes i read too fast is that an adverb yes and sometimes indistinctly oh what a number of adverbs there are to describe my manner of reading said mary laughing i wish you would keep to the first mary and always read well or if you wish to add other adverbs let them be to read slowly distinctly fluently prettily i think mamma the adverbs all end in l y not all those that end in l y are taken from adjectives slow distinct fluent pretty are adjectives which show the quality of the noun slowly distinctly fluently are adverbs which show the manner of the verb you say a slow horse a distinct reader a fluent tongue a pretty child then if you add ly to those adjectives you change them into the adverbs slowly distinctly fluently and prettily and you add them to verbs instead of to nouns now let me see mamma whether i cannot find out an adjective that may be changed into an adverb she thought a little then said this is a nice cake nice is the adjective and nicely the adverb yes you may say it is nicely baked nice you see is the adjective belonging to the noun cake and nicely the adverb belonging to the verb to bake i will write down a few adjectives with their corresponding adverbs dirty dirtily sweet sweetly wide widely high highly fresh freshly new newly i wonder mamma said mary that adjectives are not called ad nouns i should remember much more easily what they meant i shall never forget what adverb means because the word tells you at once but i must guess to what an adjective is to be added very true my dear but we cannot take upon ourselves to change the names which grammarians have given to the different parts of speech then mary besides the adverb which shows the manner of the verb there are others which point out the place in which it is done as i stand here i walk thither she went hence he will go anywhere pray mamma let me find out some of the adverbs that show the place i thought my thimble was there she said opening a workbox but she added looking about i can find it nowhere very well mary that is if it is only an example you are supposing and that you have not really lost your thimble oh no here it is said mary smiling and lifting up her forefinger this is not all continued her mother there are some adverbs which relate to the time in which the verb is performed as i eat now john will go soon he has been already now it is my turn mamma i dance often but i seldom draw he will write presently will you go directly the next class of adverbs said her mother points out the number of times the verb is performed as i spoke once or twice or a hundred times oh what a great deal of speaking exclaimed mary and are one two three four and all the numbers adverbs no because they do not relate to the verb but to the noun you say one apple two houses 
ten men, and so on. Then the numbers are adjectives, said Mary. Yes, they do not, it is true, exactly show the quality of the noun, but they point out its number. When you mention the number of the verb, you do not say, I wrote one, but I wrote once. Well, said Mary, I do think so many different sorts of adverbs is a little puzzling. You have at least learned enough of them today, my dear, replied her mother. Go and take a run in the garden to refresh yourself. Continuation of Adverbs, Lesson 10 In order to be able to recollect all the different sorts of adverbs, my dear, said Mary's mother to her, you must class them in regular order in your memory. Yes, said Mary, I must put them in order in my head, as I do my doll's clothes in her chest of drawers. Very well, replied her mother, smiling at the comparison, and put each class in a separate drawer. How droll, said Mary, laughing, that my head should be like a chest of drawers. I hope it is like a tidy chest of drawers, Mary. I have known some little girls whose drawers were in such confusion that when they want anything in them, they do not know in which drawer to look for it. And when that is the case, she added, looking archly at Mary, I cannot help suspecting that their heads are in the same sort of confusion. Yes, but I do not think you know such a little girl just now, Mamma. for if you recollect, you praised me the other day for having my drawers in such tidy order. Well, then, it is to be hoped, Mary, that I shall find your head so too. Now let us see how many drawers you must have to keep the adverbs in. Do you recollect how many we have already mentioned? Let me see, said Mary, thinking. Why, first I must have a drawer, and a pretty large one, for the adverbs relating to the manner of the verb. There are so many of them, such as prettily, cleverly, nicely. Then another for adverbs relating to place, as here, there, everywhere. Then a third drawer for adverbs relating to time, as now, then, presently. That need not be so large a drawer, I believe. And lastly... A little tiny drawer will be big enough for the adverbs that relate to number, as once, twice, thrice, and away, she said. And then she set off with a hop, skip, and a jump, and ran to the other end of the room, an exercise which never failed to relieve her mind when weary of thinking. But, my dear, said her mother, you know that we have not finished the adverbs. There are several other classes for you to learn then i must have some more drawers to put them in and pray what are they the next class of adverbs relates to the quantity of the verb as you have read enough he has eaten sufficiently another class of adverbs asks questions as how do you do what do you say why should we go when shall we set out oh yes i know those are questions because there is a note of interrogation but what does that have to do with a verb? In the sentence, how do you do? How relates to the verb to do? And means, how does your health do? In what do you say? What relates to the verb to say? And so on. Mary inquired whether there were any adverbs that answered questions. Yes, there are, replied her mother. Especially two little words that you are very fond of. Mary wondered what they could be. Suppose I were to ask whether you have read today, what would you answer? I should say yes, for I have read a long chapter in the history of England with Miss Thompson. But supposing that you have not read today, then I should say no. Well, then yes and no are adverbs, and so are all other words that reply to a question, such as perhaps, surely, certainly, by no means, not at all. But Mama, said Mary, yes and no by themselves cannot relate to any verb. I beg your pardon? If you say yes in answer to my question, have you read? You mean to say, yes, I have read. You see, therefore, that yes, by itself, refers to the verb to read, though the verb is not mentioned. Some adverbs have degrees of comparison as often, oftener, oftenest, well, better, best. But Mama, said Mary, interrupting her, you said that good, better, best were adjectives. 
good replied she is always an adjective but better and best are sometimes adjectives and sometimes adverbs oh that is very puzzling and in my parsing lessons how am i to find out whether they are adjectives or adverbs by observing whether they relate to nouns or to verbs if i say i spoke well you spoke better but henry spoke best the words well better best are adverbs because they relate to the verb to speak but if you say a good child a better child the best child the degrees of comparison relate to the noun child and are therefore adjectives yes and then you must say good instead of well for it would be nonsense to say a well child whenever said her mother the two degrees of comparison better and best are used as adverbs the positive is well and when they are used as adjectives the positive is good let me find out an example mamma first for adjectives i am a good dancer sophie is a better dancer but ellen dances best stop said her mother there is an error in your example try if you can find it out mary repeated the phrase slowly and deliberately but she thought in vain and could not discover the fault what can it be mamma said she in the first two degrees of comparison replied her mother you are right but when you said ellen dances best the word best relates to the verb dances and not the noun dancer to be sure said mary i did not think of that a dancer is a person and a noun while dances is the verb and is it wrong to mix the adjectives and the adverbs so in one sentence not at all replied her mother now mary i believe that we have gone through the different classes of adverbs do you think that you can recollect them all i will try mamma an adverb is a word added to a verb to show something that relates to it first the manner of the verb as he speaks well secondly the place of the verb as ellen came here thirdly the time of the verb as i write now fourthly the number of the verb as they drank twice fifthly adverbs that ask questions as what shall we do sixthly those which answer questions as yes no oh but mamma i must have two more drawers for my questions and answers for you know that i did not reckon them in my chest of drawers very true mary said her mother and i think we may now take leave of adverbs and for to-morrow i have prepared a story instead of a lesson mary was pleased to hear this for though she now liked her lessons of grammar she liked the story still better the sponge cakes mrs burton was one day walking in the fields with her little daughter harriet who skipped on before her through the grass the gay flowers sprung up beneath her feet and smelt very sweet but she did not stop to gather them for she was impatient to reach the village where they were going to the pastry cooks harriet had sixpence of her own to lay out and all the way she went she was thinking what sort of cake she would buy for herself she liked plum buns but she meant also to buy a cake for her little sister fanny and she was not sure what she would like best in their way they stopped at mrs spruce's the washerwoman's cottage as mrs burton had some directions to give her mrs spruce had a pretty little daughter called alice who often accompanied her mother when she carried home mrs burton's linen from washing and then harriet and alice sometimes played together so harriet was very glad to call at the cottage to see alice and she ran forward and opening the little garden gate called out alice alice but no alice answered when they went in they saw poor alice sitting quite still in a low chair and looking so pale and ill that she seemed as if she had not the strength to move what is the matter with poor alice inquired mrs burton indeed madam i cannot say replied mrs spruce she has been in this downcast way for this week and more the doctor calls it a sort of low fever but no wonder she is so weak for i can get her to eat nothing the only thing she fancies is a bit of sponge cake a lady gave her one last wednesday but it is all gone and i cannot afford to buy her any more 
does the doctor think it good for her to eat sponge cake inquired mrs burton he says it will do her no harm if she wishes it soon after mrs burton and her little daughter left the cottage and as they walked towards the village they could talk of nothing but poor alice when they reached the pastry cooks mrs burton asked harriet if she had made up her mind what she should buy oh yes mamma sponge cakes and she inquired how many she could have for sixpence she was told three and three sponge cakes were put in a piece of paper and given to her and she paid for them i thought my dear said her mother that you had intended to buy plum buns so i did mamma but i have bought these cakes for poor alice she can eat nothing else you know while i am hungry for everything so it is much better alice should have the cakes than for me to have buns you are a good child said her mother giving her a kind kiss to think what will please others rather than yourself but then little fanny will she like to go without her cake she is too young to care about alice oh she does not know anything about the cake mamma for i did not tell her i should give her one i meant to surprise her so she will not be disappointed when they approached the cottage on their way home harriet hastened forward pushed open the garden gate and was soon in the house then she opened her little parcel and gave one of the cakes to alice poor alice smiled and though it was but faintly harriet was delighted to see her face which was before so melancholy look pleased alice tasted a little bit and said it was very good but she would not eat much saying that she would keep the rest for another time oh here are two more cakes said harriet eagerly and they are all for you alice how good you are my dear young lady said mrs spruce you have made poor alice quite happy harriet felt quite happy too she was much happier than if she had eaten the cake herself she was so glad to do some good to poor alice in her way home she gathered a quantity of field flowers i shall give some of them to fanny she said instead of the cake and then she will be pleased too harriet liked to please every one but she herself was the happiest of any one because she enjoyed making others happy End of chapter 6chapter seven of mary's grammar by jane marset this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by jennifer dalman prepositions lesson eleven at the next lesson mary's mother asked her what the grammar said about prepositions prepositions repeated mary what a long hard word her mother took up the book and pointed out the place to her daughter who read as follows prepositions serve to connect nouns together and to show the relation between them i do not know what relation means continued she unless it's like uncle and aunt howard and my cousins who are all our relations they are called our relations replied her mother because they belong to the same family that we do but the relation between words is not quite the same thing you will understand it if i give you an example here is a table that is a noun and there is a chair that is another noun now if i say put the chair by the table by is the preposition which shows the relation between the table and the chair if i left out the preposition and said put the chair the table you could not understand what i meant no indeed mamma for it would be nonsense but the little word by explains it all very clearly now said her mother can you tell me what relation there is between this book and the table the book does not stand by the table like the chair said mary it lies on the table and which is the preposition mary thought a little and then replied the book lies no it is not lies for lies is the verb it is what the book does then she suddenly exclaimed on the table yes on is the word which shows the relation between the book and the table you are right said her mother now where is the footstool it is under the table answered mary and i guess that under is the preposition now mamma i run round the table is not round a preposition also yes it is when used in that sense but if you say that is a round table round would not in that case show the relation of the table to anything else so round would not then be a preposition oh but i know what it would be mamma it would be an adjective for it would show what sort of table it was 
mary having run once or twice round the table placed one of her feet upon the footstool and springing up seated herself upon the table now mamma she said what is the preposition that connects me with the table on or upon which you like best but i fear that my table may suffer from your frolics so you had better come down and sit in a chair near the table oh yes near is a preposition and she seated herself on the side of the table opposite to her mother who said here mary catch this ball of worsted which i am going to throw over the table mary caught it and asked how over could be a preposition for the ball had not touched the table that is true replied her mother yet over shows the relation between the ball and the table the table was underneath while the ball went over it the chair which stands by the table does not necessarily touch it nor does the footstool which is under the table well let us now try something else besides the table said mary there is a man walking across the street can you find out the preposition let me see it is across yes across shows the relation between the two nouns man and street now he's going into that house mamma oh she cried pleased at the discovery into is a preposition between man and house and now he is gone upstairs for see he is looking out of the window but mamma is up a preposition for there is only one noun in the sentence he is gone upstairs who was it that went upstairs my dear oh the man to be sure but i did not say the man no but you said he went upstairs what did he mean he is the pronoun put instead of the man noun that is true and it is just the same as if you said the man went upstairs so then a preposition shows the relationship between a noun and a pronoun as well as between two nouns certainly or between two pronouns you stand by me you and me are both pronouns and by shows their relation to each other he speaks to her said mary to is the preposition which relates to the pronouns he and her i think mary i have nothing more to tell you about prepositions so we will now finish the lesson and to-morrow we shall proceed to conjunctions and as there is but very little to say on interjections we may comprise them in the same lesson and then i have a long story for the conclusion end of chapter seven chapter eight of mary's grammar by jane marset this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by jennifer dalman conjunctions lesson twelve conjunctions are words that have not much meaning in themselves but serve the purpose of joining words or parts of sentences together if i say fetch me a pen and some writing paper the sentence consists of two parts joined together by the little word and oh yes i understand said mary the first part of the sentence is fetch me a pen and the second part some writing paper and the little word and joins them both together and so it is called a conjunction now mamma let me try to think of a sentence then after a pause she said i will fetch my doll and her cradle and then she suddenly exclaimed why mamma how very like conjunctions are to prepositions you know that a preposition shows the relation between two nouns and the conjunction and does just the same thing for it shows the relation between pen and paper and between my doll and her cradle no mary it joins the words but it does not show how they are related to each other when i say bring me a pen and some writing paper i mean nothing more than that you should bring me those two things but i do not point out any connection between them oh but you know mamma i must think that you're going to write and then i am sure that there is a great connection between the pen and the paper you may think what you please my dear said her mother smiling but there is no relationship between them pointed out by the little word and if i had said bring me my pen on the writing paper or in the writing paper that would show a connection for the pen would be placed in or on the paper oh yes said mary and if i said i will fetch my doll in her cradle instead of and her cradle i should say a preposition instead of a conjunction besides said her mother 
and is not only used to join nouns together but any two parts of a sentence whatever thus i may say bring your book and come and read there is the noun book in the first part of the sentence and the latter part consists of two verbs and there are two conjunctions mamma for the two verbs are also joined by and yes you know i told you that conjunctions served to join words as well as sentences together but we have talked a great deal about the word and mary without mentioning any other conjunction you may play with your doll if you please oh yes if joins the two parts of the sentence quite as well as and and seems to have more meaning in it there are a great many more conjunctions said her mother i will ride or i will walk i shall drive to highgate but not to hampstead i will go with you mamma if you will let me i hope it is true and not merely playing at finding out conjunctions well my dear to-morrow perhaps you may but you may now think only of your lesson for unless you are very attentive you can go neither to hampstead nor to highgate what a number of conjunctions exclaimed mary observe said her mother the change which different conjunctions make in a meaning of a sentence if instead of saying i will give you an orange and an apple i should say i will give you an orange or an apple oh but it's not the same thing at all mamma i like the conjunction and much the best it has a great deal more meaning than i thought at first for it joins the real apple and the orange together as well as the words apple and orange and then you give me both very true mary now those conjunctions which join things or actions together are called copulative conjunctions and those which disjoin them are called disjunctive conjunctions oh dear what long words exclaimed mary when i say you may either ride or walk what sort of conjunction is either disjunctive said mary because it disjoins walking and riding for it means that you will do one or the other but not both but how can a conjunction both join and disjoin things at the same time mamma you must distinguish between things and words replied her mother a conjunction always joins the words or the parts of which the sentence is composed but it does not always join the things or the actions the sentence talks about oh yes said mary it joins the two words walk and ride but it does not join the two things walking and riding i see you understand it mary but you do not express it well you should not say the two things but the two actions for you know that walking and riding are verbs not nouns and therefore cannot be things yes said mary they are actions and an action means doing the verb now let me find out some disjunctive conjunctions sophie will neither eat nor drink those are disjunctive conjunctions but if i say she both eats and drinks the conjunction and is copulative because it joins the actions eating and drinking as well as the words eat and drink very well or you might say sophie will eat as well as drink i think we now may take leave of conjunctions and proceed to interjections end of chapter eight Chapter Nine of Mary's Grammar by Jane Marset. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Jennifer Dalman. Interjections. This part of speech can hardly be called words, for it consists of exclamations or cries uttered by a person who admires or is surprised or frightened, such as "Oh, ah, alas, oh dear me." they are very easy to find out for they are always written with a line and a dot after them interjections amused mary extremely she remembered an old nurse who used to sigh and say hi ho and alack and a well day and asked whether those were interjections her mother told her they were but mamma said mary nurse used to say so very often without admiring anything or being surprised or frightened very aged people said her mother are apt to use exclamations of that sort from a feeling of weariness without thinking 
and i know some very young people mary who acquire the same habit from the vivacity and impatience of youth but then their exclamations are shorter did you never hear a little girl say oh yes and oh dear no when a simple yes or no would have done as well perhaps they would said mary but i like much better saying oh and ah and she skipped about the room repeating every interjection she could recollect and when out of breath she sat down saying well i shall never forget interjections they are so funny but mary said her mother you should add something to your interjections to express what it is that frightens or delights you i am neither frightened nor delighted mamma it is only make-believe then make believe to be frightened or delighted with something mary thought a little and then said oh i am afraid of that horse which is galloping so fast will run over me and now for an exclamation of pleasure said her mother you are going to tell me a long story to-morrow mamma ah how glad i shall be and when you have heard it i hope that you will use an interjection of admiration oh yes replied mary you may be sure that i shall say oh dear how pretty it is well i see that we must come to the story at last and the next day she read as follows the crust of bread a fairy tale edward a little boy six years old was one day strolling about the garden eating a large crust of bread he threw himself on the grass and lay idly basking in the sun without thinking of anything all at once there appeared before him a beautiful fairy whose name was instruction her dress shone with the brilliant colors of the rainbow and she wore a crown of flowers on her head in one hand she held a silver wand with which she could perform wonderful things and in the other a book the leaves of which were all made of looking-glass and which was no less wonderful than the wand she smiled and looked so good-humouredly on edward that instead of being frightened he was quite pleased she then opened and showed him her book in the first page he saw himself and everything around him reflected as you do in a common looking-glass but the other pages were of a much more extraordinary nature for they reflected objects which were quite out of sight and even in the most remote parts of the world in one page he beheld lions and tigers in africa roaming about in search of prey edward shrunk back half frightened at seeing them move and look alive but the fairy explained to him that it was only a representation of a wild beast just as his face was represented on the first page so that there was really nothing to fear she then turned over another leaf and edward saw a large elephant in india tearing up a young tree by the roots with his trunk in another page she showed him the monkeys climbing up the trees in the woods in america and hanging by their tails to the branches gibbering and pelting each other with nuts while the parrots with their gaudy plumage flew about as common as sparrows do here the fairy now closed her book edward begged of her to show him a few more of the looking-glass leaves and declared that he had never seen any picture book that could be compared to this but the fairy said that there were so many children wanting to see it that she could not stay with him any longer oh dear cried edward what shall i do when you are gone and nothing to amuse me you seemed very well amused before i came said the fairy lounging as you were on the grass and eating your crust of bread so i was replied edward but since you have shown me that pretty book i shall do nothing but long to see it again i don't care for my crust of bread any longer well said the fairy i will make you care for your bread again i will give the bread the power of speaking and it shall tell you its history from beginning to end will that not amuse you yes indeed it would replied edward it would be so strange to hear the crust of bread speak take care to hold it to your ear and not to your mouth said the fairy smiling for were you thoughtlessly to give it a bite whilst it was speaking it would tell you no more then she waved her wand over the bread and disappeared when she was gone edward began to think she must have been joking however he took up the bread and held it to his ear he started back with surprise when he heard a small gentle voice speak as follows the first thing i can remember was when i was only a grain of corn lying in a large room with a great many other grains we remained there a long time 
when one day a man came and took out a quantity of us he put us into a sack and carried us away soon after he took us to a field that had just been ploughed and there he took us out of the sack and strewn us in handful on the ground that was sowing corn said edward i shall never forget continued the bread how sweet and fresh the newly ploughed earth smelt and how much i enjoyed lying there with the warm sunbeams shining on me soon after there came by a flight of crows and the laborers being away they alighted on the ground and began picking up all the grains of corn within their reach i lay trembling with alarm thinking my turn would come and that i should be devoured but before they reached the spot where i was the laborers returned to the field and drove them away soon after there was a shower of rain and some of the drops fell upon me and carried me down with them into the ground where i was quite safe from the birds there i remained some time but i found that i began to swell and grow so large that at last my skin could not hold me so it burst open and out there came at one end a little tuft of small roots scarcely larger than hairs these stuck in the ground and grew downwards at the other end out came a tiny green stalk which soon grew above the ground at first it looked like a small blade of grass but it grew taller and taller and stronger and stronger and at last a beautiful ear of corn was seen at the top of this stalk and a few long leaves like those of grass grew on the stalk thus from a small seed of corn i was changed into a little plant and a very pretty change it was the little roots sucked in water which went up all through my green veins into the ear and made it swell out and grow large and full of seeds then when the hot weather came the sun turned me yellow as gold and the wind blew me about with the other ears of corn that grew in the field beside me and i assure you we all felt very proud of our grace and beauty but our pride did not last long for one day a number of men came into the field with sickles and cut us down those were the reapers said edward we were then bound up in sheaves and set upright on the ground leaning one against the other for support for being separated from our roots in the ground we were no longer able to stand upright we remained all night on the ground and the next day we were put into a large cart and carried to a barn there we were stowed for some time and left quiet excepting that a frightful rat now and then found its way into the barn and made great havoc amongst us devouring as many of us as he could swallow for his breakfast after some time a number of men came again and pulled us down and spreading us upon the floor of the barn began beating us most unmercifully those were the thrashers said edward it was well for you that you could not feel for those double sticks they used called flails give very hard blows it was indeed replied the crust of bread well these hard blows drove us out of all the ears in which we grew the stalks which were then nothing but straw were taken away but the grains of corn with the chaff were put into a large flat basket and shaken about until the chaff was all blown away and nothing but the grains remained so then you were changed back into a grain of corn said edward not into one grain replied the bread but into twenty or thirty i was but a single grain it is true when i was first sown in the ground but i sprang up with so fine an ear that i do believe i had nearly thirty seeds no others were so plump and well grown as myself well the next thing that happened to me was being sent to the mill to be ground all to pieces to make flour and after that to the baker who mixed me up with water and yeast and made me into a piece of dough and after i had been well kneaded he put me into an oven to bake i thus became part of a loaf of bread which the baker's boy brought here to-day to be eaten at the last word the voice failed the power of the fairy's wand was at an end edward waited for some time to listen whether the bread would say any more and finding it quite silent he took it from his ear put it to his mouth and ate it up end of chapter nine Chapter Ten of Mary's Grammar by Jane Marset. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Jennifer Dalman. Chapter Ten, Part the Second, Nouns. Lesson One. 
mary having passed some months without learning any grammar her mother asked her one day whether she would not like to know something more of the different parts of speech thinking that she was now eight years old she was capable of proceeding further in the study mary was very willing to proceed she had no longer any dislike of grammar and if she thought it a little tiresome sometimes she remembered the story at the end used to make up for it all you mean to go on with the stories too mamma she said smiling her mother consented but on condition that she would occasionally make them useful as parsing exercises i do not think it necessary to teach you anything more on articles adjectives adverbs conjunctions prepositions or interjections what you have learned of them is sufficient for a child of your age but there is a great deal more to be said on nouns pronouns and verbs mary was glad of that for those were the parts of speech she liked the best we will begin with the nouns or substantives said her mother they are divided into two sorts proper and common a noun proper is the name of any individual person place or thing mary inquired what an individual meant it means said her mother any one particular thing you are an individual and your name mary is a noun proper because it distinguishes you from other children but when i call you child that is a noun common because it belongs to all other children as well as to you but mary does not belong to me only mamma there is mary hunter and mary banks you know and a great many other marys several persons may have the same name but still it is the individual name of each it does not belong to all women and children if i say children it is a noun common because it belongs to the whole class of children if i say boy it is a noun common to all boys and girls is a noun common to all girls but if i say john or harriet those are nouns proper belonging to particular individuals oh yes i understand the difference church is a noun common to all churches but st paul's is a noun proper to that church only town said her mother is a noun common to all cities but london york and bristol are nouns proper to those towns and dog mamma is common to all dogs but alfin and carlo are the proper names of our two dogs the next thing to be considered with regard to nouns her mother told her was their number what an immense number there must be exclaimed mary for the name of everything in the whole world you know is a noun the meaning of number in grammar her mother said is much less comprehensive for it consists only of two the singular and the plural the singular means one a single thing and the plural means more than one i thought said mary that singular meant something very odd or strange suppose we were to see a very funny-looking carriage passing by you would say look what a singular carriage that is it is true replied her mother that singular is often used in that sense but the original meaning is the same you call the carriage singular because there is no other like it if so the carriage is single or alone of its kind and is therefore of the singular number ah so it is well that is very singular said mary laughing but mamma you never say that a common coach or carriage that is not singular is plural do you no replied her mother the word plural is never used in any other sense than more than one so then said mary a singular carriage or a singular thing does not so much mean that it's something very comical as that it is singular from having nothing else like it that no doubt was the original meaning of the word singular but it is so commonly used to express extraordinary things that the idea of strange and wonderful became attached to it and that of being alone or single of its kind was generally forgotten what is your idea of the word odd mary something very droll that makes one laugh does an odd glove make you laugh oh dear no exclaimed mary it makes me more inclined to cry for you know that you are displeased with me when i have lost one of my gloves and have only an odd one but that odd is quite another word from the odd that makes you laugh at least it has another meaning i believe my dear that it is not only the same word but that like singular it had originally the same meaning 
an odd glove means that it has no fellow so that it is alone or singular and when you say an odd person who makes you laugh or stare with wonder the original meaning was a man so unlike others that he was alone or singular now for the plural number the plural said mary i know means a great many things not always a great many for two is plural as well as a thousand the plural therefore speaks of any number more than one it is usually formed by adding the letter s to the singular thus the plural of dog is dogs oh yes said mary and the plural of boy boys girl girls and of child childs oh no that is not right cried she interrupting herself the plural of child is children very true though the plural is most commonly formed by the addition of an s there are many exceptions to this rule of which child and children affords one example but there are a variety of others tell me what is the plural of church it is churches replied mary then you see that you add es to church to render it plural you could not say church with an s you would not know how to pronounce it the same is the case with the words brush sash box kiss and almost all nouns that end in s double s and ch pronounced soft sh and x yes replied mary the plural of brush is brushes of kiss kisses of sash sashes of box boxes but what do you mean by ch pronounced soft as it is pronounced in the word church in the word monarch it is said to be pronounced hard and then only s is added to render its plural now tell me what are the plurals of the words loaf wife and calf loaves wives and calves replied mary in those words therefore ves is added her mother then told her that in almost all nouns ending in either f as in loaf or f e as wife the f or the f e must be taken away and the ves be put in its place to form the plural mary thought of an example the plural of half she said is halves of life lives of knife knives oh i shall not forget that her mother then bid her to observe that nouns ending in y with a consonant before the y form the plural in ies as fly flies quantity quantities mary thought there was no end to the variations in changing from singular to plural but her mother said that there were some nouns which did not change at all as sheep for instance can you tell me whether the word sheep is singular or plural no indeed i cannot unless you say whether you are speaking of one sheep or of several that is because sheep is both singular and plural you are therefore obliged to point out the number by saying there is a sheep or there are some sheep when you say a sheep i know it is singular because the article a is never put before plural nouns but if you say the sheep it would be impossible to know whether you meant one or many because the article the may be placed before either singular or plural nouns then how can you find it out mamma you may either mention the number or if you are talking of what the sheep are doing the verb will point out the number as the sheep is feeding or the sheep are feeding that is said mary the verb will point out whether the number is singular or plural but not the precise number if it is plural certainly not you must remember that when we talk of number in grammar we mean only the singular and the plural but mamma if i said a flock of sheep what would that be for there is only one flock and a great number of sheep so that the flock is singular and the sheep are plural very true but which of the two are you talking of of both together replied mary if i say a flock by itself it would be singular but if i say a flock of sheep it seems to be both singular and plural at once that cannot be said her mother a flock of sheep is of the singular number it is the flock you are speaking of the sheep are only mentioned as being the animals of which the flock is composed mary did not seem quite satisfied with this explanation she did not think it fair towards the sheep then her mother added 
that nouns of this description were distinguished by the name of nouns of multitude showing that though they are a singular number they consist of a great many individuals that a crowd a congregation an assembly were all nouns of multitude let me think of some said mary there is a herd of cattle as well as a flock of sheep and a drove of pigs and then a swarm of bees your nouns of multitude were all made up of people mamma and mine are all made up of common animals but are there not nouns of multitude for things also what do you think of a forest of trees mary a ton of coals a load of gravel or a nosegay of flowers her mother then told her that there were some nouns that were of a plural number only as scissors bellows snuffers tongs and many others i think i can guess why they are of plural number mamma scissors you know are made of two blades that cut and two handles so it is sort of a double instrument and that must be the reason why it is called plural and bellows and tongs and snuffers are all made of two halves also her mother thought it very possible that she might be right in her conjecture she then wrote down some few nouns which vary in the singular and the plural numbers in a very irregular manner as follows goose geese penny pence tooth teeth foot feet mouse mice man men woman woman child children brother brothers or brethren her mother then said that she had now learnt the meaning of a noun proper and a noun common and also the difference between the singular and the plural number it was as much as she could well remember at once she would therefore reserve what she had further to say on nouns till the next lesson end of chapter ten chapter eleven of mary's grammar by jane marset this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by jennifer dolman continuation of nouns lesson two gender mary's mother told her that she would now explain to her the genders of nouns that there were three genders the masculine the feminine and the neuter these are all new words mamma said mary and i do not understand one of them her mother said that a man a bull a lion a drake are all of the masculine gender and that a woman a cow a lioness a duck are of the feminine gender and is there no gender that means young creatures like little boys and girls and chickens and ducklings inquired mary no for they are either of the masculine or the feminine gender oh yes boys and girls grow up to be men and women said mary and i suppose little ducklings will grow up into ducks and drakes yes said her mother and thus all animals are of the masculine or the feminine gender but then mamma what is there left to belong to the neuter gender everything that is not an animal and there are a tolerable number mary for that gender do you mean things and places such as a house a table a field yes and everything that can be put upon a table and everything that is in the house and everything that grows in the field for grass and trees and all vegetables are of the neuter gender and minerals too said mary i suppose earth and coals and stones and then the metals mamma gold and silver and lead and iron and i know not how many others nor i neither mary it would be impossible to enumerate them all and yet they may all be comprised in one little sentence everything excepting animals why then after all said mary i dare say that there are more nouns of the neuter gender than there are of the masculine and feminine genders i believe that would be difficult to determine for no one knows what number of animals there are in the world or what are the number of vegetables and minerals i thought mamma learned men knew all of these things they know a great deal more than we do my dear but it is god alone who can know the extent of his vast and beneficent creation the more we learn of his works the better for the more we shall know how great is his power how infinite his wisdom 
and how unbounded his goodness towards his creatures mary was awed by the solemnity of her mother's words but though she felt their force she did not venture to make any reply and her mother went on with the lesson and asked her if she knew what pronoun was used for the masculine gender i say he or him for a man mamma and she and her for a woman but what is the pronoun for the neuter gender do you not recollect in speaking of this table for instance i should say it is too heavy for me to move yes now i remember it is the pronoun for the neuter gender the plural pronouns they them their those will suit all the genders equally well for you may say do not eat those apples they are sour their seeds are bitter throw them away you may also say look at those men and women they are very busy their work is hard i should like to help them but mamma i heard you say the other day when you were looking at that great ship in the river how beautifully she sails and yet a ship is not an animal and is not alive though it sails very true mary an animal does not sail it swims and moves itself in the water while a ship sails because the wind blows against its sails and makes it go then why did you call the ship she as if it was a living animal of the feminine gender it is sometimes permitted when we speak of anything very grand or very beautiful to personify it that is to say to pretend or as you would say make believe that it is a person thus we often call the sun he and say the sun is shining in all his glory he gives us light and heat and when we personify the moon we use the feminine gender and say she shines upon us with her soft silvery light i know said mary that the gardener calls his spade he for i heard him say one day he is a famous spade then the coachman calls the whip he too but i am sure that cannot be because the spade and the whip are grand or beautiful no it is an improper manner of speaking not uncommon amongst ignorant people they think they bestow a mark of regard on anything that they are proud of or fond of by speaking of it as they would do of a person this is so common among the peasantry in some parts of the country that they call almost everything he and she i recollect last summer a poor woman who had broken her arm saying she had hurt her shocking bad all the night and as i had desired a woman to sit with her i concluded till the matter was explained that it was the nurse who had hurt her and not the arm well said mary i do not personify anything but my doll and i am sure she has a right to it she looks so pretty and so much as if she were alive well you may go and play with her now said mother for the lesson is finished and to-morrow i intend to treat you with a story blind tommy harry villers was walking one day with his parents by the side of the river the path was broad and far enough from the water's edge to prevent any danger of his falling in his mamma therefore gave him leave to run on before to gather the cowslips which grew on the bank harry observed a little boy at some distance before him who had collected a quantity of cowslips and he called to his papa and mamma to beg them to hasten on as he wanted to overtake the child in order to see the ball of cowslips which he was tying up they had nearly reached the boy at the turn of the river but he instead of following the path which continued alongside the water walked straight on to the brink and fell in mr and mrs villers and harry ran to the spot and saw the poor child struggling in the water mr villers instantly threw off his hat and coat and plunged in but before he could reach the boy his screams of distress had ceased he had sunk to the bottom and nothing could be seen now but the scattered cowslips floating on the surface of the stream harry whose cries had been almost equal to those of the child before he sunk became still more terrified when he saw his father in the water his mother tried to pacify him by showing him how well his father could swim in saying she hoped that he would be able to save the child but he is drowned sobbed harry and papa will be drowned too 
his papa hallooed out to him that there was no danger for himself and that though the boy had sunk he would soon rise again and then he would try to catch hold of him a few moments afterwards the child was seen rising to the surface but the current of the stream had carried him to some distance from the spot where mr villars was swimming and was bearing him still further off but the instant mr villars perceived him he swam after him so fast that he soon overtook him seized hold of him by the hair which had spread out on the water and dragged him ashore mrs villars and harry who had followed along the bank of the river reached the spot just as he was brought to land the poor boy appeared quite lifeless and mr villars himself dripping with wet carried him in his arms to a neighboring cottage he was there undressed and put into a warm bed and in a short time to the great joy of all he showed signs of returning animation and soon after opened his eyes but they were shocked to see them without any expression and looking quite dead though the rest of his body was restored to life alack a day exclaimed the dame of the cottage if this is not poor blind tommy run jack she said to her son and fetch his mother the accident was now accounted for poor tommy had walked into the river not from heedlessness but because he could not see when the mother arrived she was sadly distressed at the state in which she found her son but the instant he heard her voice he called to her and clasping his arms round her neck said oh mother dear i thought i should never kiss you again i thought i was quite drowned the poor woman reproached herself for letting her blind boy go out alone and she said that she wished to keep him more at home under her own eye but that he was so fond of rambling about in the open air that she could not find it in her heart to refuse him especially as he was very careful in general and had never met with a serious accident before i will never do so any more cried poor little tommy as if he had committed a fault i was so busy with my cowslips that i did not find out that i had lost the path till i fell into the water and now all my sweet cowslips are lost but how could you see the cowslips without eyes said willie i did not see them replied the boy i smelt them and when i stooped to gather them i felt them well i don't think i could smell cowslips said willie if i shut my eyes and so i should not know where to stoop to gather them tommy seemed too weak to talk any more but his mother answered for him and said you have eyes to see with my little master but my poor boy who has none is obliged to snuff about with his nose like a dog to find things out by their smell so at last he has learnt to smell almost as well as a dog and he can hear a great deal better than those who see continued she and when the pot is set to boil on the fire he is on the watch and runs to tell me the instant it begins to bubble that i may take it off before it boils over tommy was then left quiet and harry allowed to watch by the bedside on condition he should not speak to him mrs villars retired with the mother to the further end of the room and asked whether she would like her son to be placed in the blind institution ah that is what i have been trying for for many a year madam said the poor woman but never could get him in at first tommy was very much against it himself not liking to leave us but now he has grown older and sees what a trouble his blindness is to us all he has made up his mind to it if we could but get him a presentation then after this accident said mrs villars he will probably grow more timid and be glad to be settled in a place where he will feel perfectly secure she promised to exert herself to get him into the institution and whilst they were talking the matter over in a low voice harry who had been watching by the bedside came up and whispered mamma he has gone to sleep mrs villars then took leave being impatient to join her husband who had left them as soon as he had found the boy was safe in order to get dry clothes she assured the boy's mother that if she was careful his sleep should not be disturbed he would probably be quite well when he awoke 
the next day mrs villars went to the blind institution and took harry with her he was much surprised to see so many blind people and how cleverly they did what they were about the women and little girls worked at their needle as neatly as if they could see and sung whilst they were at work and when they were tired of singing one of the matrons read to them the men and the boys were busy making baskets weaving mats and ropes and a variety of works which harry thought very amusing they afterwards went into the refectory to see the blind people at dinner and when harry inquired what this and that dish was they answered him readily before they had had tasted this is boiled mutton that is stewed potatoes we know them by their smell as they were returning home harry could talk of nothing but the blind people he observed that they felt and smelt and heard so much better than he could that they hardly seemed to want eyes that is true replied his mother god almighty in his goodness softened the affliction of blindness by making their other sentences more perfect then mamma after all said harry perhaps tommy is as happy as i am when he don't fall into the water oh no replied she think what a pity it is that poor tommy cannot see all the pretty things which delight your eyes he cannot see the beautiful colors of the flowers that smell so sweet nor the green branches of the trees under which he plays nor the clear blue sky nor the bright sunshine nor the sunshine in his mother's eyes when she is pleased to see him good and happy oh dear no said harry that is a sad thing indeed and he looked at his mother with an expression of tenderness which brought the sunshine into her eyes at once mrs villars interested herself so much to obtain an admission for poor tommy that at the next election he was chosen and went to live in the asylum he was often visited by his mother and at least once a year by mrs villars and her son who always took him some token of their regard End of chapter eleven chapter twelve of mary's grammar by jane marcet this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by jennifer dahlman continuation of nouns lesson three cases i shall this morning teach you the cases of nouns mary said her mother cases repeated mary what can they be not cases to keep nouns in surely no replied her mother smiling at her idea the cases of nouns have quite another meaning you know that the same word has sometimes more than one meaning what like the word singular mamma which sometimes means one single thing and sometimes a thing that is strange or odd yes have you never heard the word case used in any sense other than to keep things in as for instance i must prepare a dress for ellen in case she should go to the ball it will be a very hard case if she is not invited oh yes i understand those cases pretty well too and yet i am sure i could not explain what they mean these cases point out the state and condition of ellen when i say that i must prepare a dress for ellen it means that she may be in a state or condition fit to appear at a ball and when i say it will be a hard case if she is not invited i mean that her state or condition will be hard to meet with such a disappointment i thought that state and condition meant something very dirty and ugly said mary not at all like a ball dress for when i splash my frock in watering my garden nurse says oh what a condition you are in or what a state your frock is in state and condition mean how your frock is it may be in a pretty state as well as an ugly one in a clean condition as well as in a dirty one oh yes said mary nurse says sometimes let me see if your frock is in a fit state for you to go into the drawing-room and then she does not mean dirty but whether it is clean enough for the drawing-room well then mary if you understand what state and condition mean i think you may understand pretty well what the word case means oh yes mamma and i have just thought of another case do you remember when i was ill and dr berkeley came to see me 
he said well my little dear let us hear your case and i stared for i did not know what he meant till he asked me whether i had a headache or was thirsty and a number of other questions and so i found out that he meant the state of my illness yes it was necessary that he should know that in order to give you the proper remedies well after saying so much on the word case i hope you will not find it difficult to understand the cases of nouns for the cases of nouns refer also to their state or condition i dare say i shall mamma when you explain them to me but i cannot say i do now nouns have three different cases said her mother the nominative the possessive and the objective mary made a long face at these hard names they are not so difficult as you imagine my dear if i say the dog barks or the dog is tired it means that the dog does something or is something does it not yes certainly replied mary it means the dog does bark or is tired dog is the noun and the verb which follows shows you what the dog does or is yes said mary barks is a verb and so is being tired well then doing something or being something is one state or condition of the noun dog and when the dog is doing something as when the dog is running or when the dog is being something as when the dog is tired dog is said to be the nominative case oh that is not difficult mamma let me find out some other nominative cases sophie laughs sophie is the nominative case because she does something he is hungry he is the nominative case because he is something the nominative case seems quite easy now the noun comes first and the verb that follows tells you what the noun does a pronoun may be a nominative as well as a noun mary it is better therefore to say the nominative comes first instead of the noun comes first yes replied mary sophie was a nominative noun and he is a nominative pronoun and what are the other cases mamma let us return to the dog suppose i were to speak about the dog's collar or the dog's food would that mean that the dog does something or is something oh no said mary it means that the dog has something that belongs to him that is quite a different case there mary exclaimed her mother you have just used the word case without thinking of it but can you tell me what quite a different case means no indeed mamma i do not understand it enough to explain it then i must do it for you it means that the state or condition of the dog is very different in the one case or the other that is whether he does or is something or whether he has something belonging to him well then since these cases are so different it is proper to call them by different names the first i have told you is the nominative case and the second is called the possessive case perhaps mary you can guess why it is so called i suppose because the dog possesses something as in the sentences the dog's food the dog's collar the food is his it belongs to him and so does the collar too you are quite right my dear then pray mamma let me try to find out some of the nouns in the possessive case the child's doll mamma's bonnet willie's hoop her mother took a pen and wrote down the words mary had just spoken and mary inquired why she had put a comma before the s yes to all the nouns in the possessive case she replied that if dogs were written without a comma before the s yes, it would mean several dogs instead of one dog oh yes the dog's food would mean the food of a great many dogs dogs would be of the plural number you see said mary smiling i don't forget about the plural number but said her mother in the plural number it is also necessary to distinguish the possessive case from the other cases by a comma 
which is then written after the s instead of before it as the dog's food with the comma after the s means the food of several dogs but mamma you do not pronounce the comma you know so in speaking how can you tell the difference whether it is put before or after the noun for the sound is the same that is very true mary if the gamekeeper came in and talked about the dog's food i should not know whether he meant the food of any particular dog or that of all the dogs in the kennel the words must be written to be distinguished and is not this very puzzling mamma no i should easily be able to make out whether the gamekeeper was speaking about one or several dogs by the rest of his sentence besides if necessary the difference may be distinguished by saying the food of the dog or the food of the dogs that would make the meaning quite clear said mary but i am sure the gamekeeper would never say so but why mamma continued mary are there always two nouns in the possessive case in the dog's collar for instance the noun dog is followed by the noun collar instead of being followed by a verb as in the nominative case if you think a little mary you will find it out yourself what is the possessive case it is a noun that possesses something answered mary a man who possesses a gun a horse a house or anything whatever and pray what part of speech is that anything it must be a noun said mary for you know all the things in the whole world are nouns oh now i have found it out mamma the first noun possesses the thing and the second noun is the thing it possesses as sophie's doll john's horse betty's broom sophie possesses the doll john possesses the horse and betty the broom so there must be two nouns in the possessive case there are always two nouns when the possessive case is used replied her mother but they are not both in the possessive case continue the sentence and say for instance john's horse trots fast john is possessive but the horse is nominative because the horse does something he trots fast and if said mary i was to say sophie's doll is very pretty sophie would be the possessive because she possessed the doll but the doll would be nominative because she is something she is very pretty you see therefore that in the possessive case the first noun is possessive the last nominative and why mamma in the nominative case is there always a verb after the noun because the nominative case points out that the noun is doing or being something and the verb tells you what it is that the noun is doing or being i wish said mary it was called the doing and being case then i should understand it and remember it much better than nominative that is true said her mother for nominative means simply to name the noun we had better finish now mary and leave the objective case for the next lesson end of chapter twelve Chapter Thirteen of Mary's Grammar by Jane Marset. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Jennifer Dahlman. Continuation of Nouns. Lesson Four. Objective Case. Today, Mary said her mother, we are to finish the cases of nouns. I shall not be sorry for that, replied Mary, for I think they are the most difficult of all I have learnt yet. They certainly require a little thought and painstaking but you have only one more case to learn the objective this case is so much connected with the verb active that i wish you would tell me whether you recollect well the meaning of a verb active oh yes said mary the active verb tells you what the noun does that is not all mary i don't know how it is mamma said mary rather impatiently i always forget that the action must pass over to an object as john beats the dog it is a very natural mistake said her mother to think the action of doing something sufficient to make a verb active but it is not so for however great the action it is a neuter verb unless it passes over to an object the man runs the horse gallops runs and gallops are both neuter verbs well mamma 
i don't think i shall forget any more that the verb active must have an agent to act and also an object to be acted upon then my dear the noun which is the object acted upon is in the objective case is that all said mary surprised and pleased at the difficulty which she had feared was so easily got over why nothing could be more easy do let me think of some examples sophie strokes the cat the cat is the object stroke so the cat is in the objective case and sophie who strokes it said her mother is nominative yes replied mary sophie is the agent so then in the objective case there must always be two nouns one to be the agent and the other to be the object there must always be two nouns when the objective case is used it is true said her mother but they are not both in the objective case the agent is nominative and the object is objective oh yes sophie is nominative and the cat is objective but when you taught me the nominative case in the last lesson mamma you said nothing about the objective case after the verb i remember the example you gave was the dog barks because barks is a neuter verb in which you know the action does not pass over to any object but remains in the agent and as i wished at first to make the case as easy as i could i chose the nominative case to a neuter verb for an example instead of the nominative to an active verb i think mamma there ought to be some difference in the ending of the noun to show whether it is nominative or objective some sign to point out the case like the comma in the possessive case to save you the trouble of thinking said her mother smiling no you must reflect whether the noun performs the action or is the object of the action oh yes said mary the dog barks the cat purrs the kitten frolics all these nouns are in the nominative case the dog is beaten the cat is stroked the kitten is caressed all of these are in the objective case because stop mary you are wrong in your examples of the objective case why mamma is not the dog the object beaten the cat the object stroked and the kitten the object caressed true but observe that the dog the cat and the kitten are in the nominative case for they come before the verb to be beaten to be caressed are passive verbs this is terribly puzzling interrupted mary i am afraid i shall never be able to distinguish between the passive verb and the objective case i admit there may be some difficulty my dear and that it requires reflection but i will tell you something that will assist you to make the distinction it is the verb which determines the case of nouns that is to say obliges them to be in the nominative or objective case if the verb follows the noun it obliges the noun to be in the nominative case as charlie eats or sophie drinks but if the verb comes before the noun it forces the noun to be in the objective case john rides the horse mary eats cherries horse and cherries are in the objective case since it is the verb which determines the case of the noun verbs are said to govern nouns yes said mary let me think of some examples how verbs govern nouns i feed the child here the governing verb feed comes first and commands the noun child to be in the objective case the child is fed here the governing verb fed comes after the child and forces child to be in the nominative case and observe said her mother in the sentence the child is fed the verb being passive there is no noun in the objective case i will now write a sentence including all the three cases to see whether you can distinguish them she then wrote as follows the baby cries because she is sleepy so put her in the cradle but where is the baby's cradle the baby said mary is nominative because baby goes before the governing verb cries in she is sleepy she is also nominative because she comes before the verb in put her in the cradle her is objective for her comes after the governing verb put and is the object which is put in the cradle in the baby's cradle baby's is in the possessive case because cradle is something that belongs to the baby what happy nouns those possessive cases are exclaimed mary they have no domineering verbs to govern them well my dear said her mother 
i think you shall not easily forget how verbs govern nouns oh no i shall fancy that a verb is a great general who marches in the midst of a troop of nouns and commands all the soldiers that go before and all those that follow after him and if said her mother carrying on the joke a soldier instead of joining the army should send another man in his stead the general commands him also does he not to be sure said mary laughing i know what you mean mamma that verbs govern pronouns as well as nouns but mary i must tell you that there is another part of speech which governs nouns also and that is a preposition whenever a noun or pronoun is preceded by a preposition it is forced by it to be in the objective case as sit on that chair go to papa stand by the fire the prepositions on to by make the nouns chair papa and fire to be in the objective case and the sense shows them to be in the objective also said mary for chair papa and fire are the objects that i am either to sit in to go to or to stand by but i do not think it is fair said she that the poor noun should have two masters it is very well to be governed by the verbs for they are parts of speech of some consequence but it is really too bad for such little insignificant words as prepositions to pretend to govern nouns yet so it is my dear said her mother smiling and i fear they have no resource and must submit so let us leave them to their fate i must however caution you not to place implicit reliance on the rule of the nominative coming before the verb and the objective following after it as it is liable to some few exceptions the secret a tale william a little boy of seven years of age was playing one day in the garden with his friend george when the latter looking round to see no one was in sight said to him in a half whisper william i will tell you a secret if you promise not to tell oh do cried william i promise i will not say a single word about it to anybody george then said the following monday being his birthday his mamma was preparing a great treat for that day first he said we are to drink tea out of doors under the great trees but it is not to be a tea like other days only make-believe milk and water and bread and butter there is to be real tea and fruit and cakes and all sorts of nice things then after that we are to run about and play at games and then we are to dance on the grass for there is to be a fiddler to play to us then when it is dark we are to go into the house and a man is to show us the magic lantern did you ever see a magic lantern william you cannot think how funny it is what is it like inquired william oh it is pictures that look as if they were real and the people alive you cannot imagine how curious it is for you can only see them in the dark in the dark repeated willie how is it possible to see in the dark oh i don't mean you can see in the dark but only the room must be quite dark and then there is a light inside the magic lantern to show the pictures it is very difficult to explain but you would understand it at once if you saw it well after that we are to go out again in the garden what all in the dark oh yes then it must be quite dark everywhere for there are to be fireworks i have seen fireworks said willie and they make a light themselves they are called squibs and crackers oh but we are to have much grander fireworks than squibs and crackers and then besides we are to have skyrockets that fly up into the sky making such a noise tis enough to frighten you then when they go to the top they turn back and burst all into pieces and out comes what do you think why such a quantity of bright shining stars as you never saw a great deal larger than the common stars that are in the sky and down they fall twinkle twinkle all the while till they are quite out then mamma says there is to be a catherine's wheel i don't know what that is because i never saw one but she says it goes round faster than any other wheels and that it is all made of fire and it is all sorts of colors won't that be pretty yes replied william to be sure it will but am i to see it too 
oh dear yes you and sophie and mary and emily and everybody is to be invited mamma says we shall have twenty boys and girls only think what a number but if so many people are to be there said william what's the use of keeping it a secret oh because mamma says it must be a surprise and that will make them all like it the better so mind you keep your promise and don't tell oh yes said william i shall not say one word about it and he thought nothing would be so easy as to keep the secret when he returned home his mamma asked him how he had been amused and what game he had been playing at with george william instead of answering immediately and telling her everything that had passed as he was accustomed to do stood still thinking what he should say for the truth is both he and george had been so busy talking about the approaching monday that they had done nothing else after some little time william answered i do not recollect playing at anything we were only talking it must have been very entertaining conversation replied she to have kept you from play william colored he was afraid he had said something that might lead his mamma to guess the secret and he felt very uncomfortable that he could not tell her at all this made him look down abashed and his mother fancied he was ashamed i hope my dear she said that you and george have not been saying anything wrong oh no mamma and he hesitated only but i must not tell i do not know whether it is quite right for if you have said nothing improper i know no reason why you should conceal what you talked about because because mamma said william it is a secret then fearing he had gone too far he added saying it was a secret is not telling a secret is it no for i cannot tell what your secret is about and if you have promised not to tell it we had better speak no more about it for fear you should say something that might make me guess what it is william thought that it was very kind of his mamma not to press him to tell the secret if it had been sophie said he she would have never have left off teasing me to tell her all about it sophie is too young to understand that it is wrong to tell a secret but i who know that it is a great fault and that people who cannot keep a secret are laughed at and despised would on no account that you should tell me but perhaps it is better not to be told a secret they are often troublesome to keep so let us talk of something else she then took up a pen and began writing a note and said what i am writing is no secret so i will tell you william for i am sure it will please you oh do pray mamma it is to tell grandmamma that we shall go and spend the day with her on monday and she looked up to see how pleased william would be but william's countenance expressed nothing but concern and disappointment why are you not glad william i like going to see grandmamma said william but why must you go on monday and why not monday replied his mother it is a day on which i have no engagement but said william hesitating and colouring perhaps you may have an invitation mamma then i should refuse it my dear for when i have sent this note to your grandmamma i shall be engaged to her poor william sighed he knew not what to say the invitation for george's fete would come too late and he would not be able to go he stood intently watching his mother while she finished the note folding it up and directed it light me a little candle william she said to seal it but william was so wrapped in his thoughts that he scarcely heard her why my dear she exclaimed what is the matter this is very whimsical she then lighted the taper herself and having sealed the note rang for the servant to carry it when william found that the note was on the point of going he could refrain no longer and bursting into tears sobbed out must i then tell you mamma tell me what my dear child she said tenderly caressing him yes tell me anything that grieves you what my secret exclaimed he oh no stop she cried not a word of your secret you have promised and you must not tell it even to me however it may grieve you oh dear i will never promise to keep a secret any more then you must never hear one returned her mother for if you do you are bound to keep it well i will keep it mamma but then pray don't send your letter 
what can my letter have to do with your secret however i will not ask questions you ought not to answer the servant came into the room but his mother did not give him the letter she only desired him to put some coals on the fire william felt quite relieved he sprung up on his mother's lap and putting his arms round her neck kissed her tenderly soon after the servant came in again with a note from george's mother mrs middleton saying that the servant who brought it waited for an answer oh read it mamma cried william quite overjoyed read it quick it is the secret his mother read the note and the secret was at once explained well william said she smiling i suppose i may write to accept this invitation and you will not object to john's taking this letter oh no cried william i am so glad that the other letter is not gone and so glad the secret is over i thought it was very funny to have a secret but now i think it's very disagreeable i hate secrets but i like fets mamma without secrets i am very glad we shall go to george's birthday End of chapter 13chapter fourteen of mary's grammar by jane marcet this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by jennifer dolman pronouns lesson five in our former lesson on pronouns mary i taught you their meaning generally yes mamma they are the words that are put in the place of nouns we shall now divide them into classes the first of these are the personal pronouns those said mary must be the pronouns used instead of the names of persons as i you he she yes replied her mother and also in the place of things now do you remember the meaning of the singular and plural numbers oh yes we talked so much about them the singular means one single person or thing and the plural several perhaps only a few perhaps a great many but always more than one well my dear there are three persons in the singular number and three in the plural what do you mean exclaimed mary with a look of surprise that would make only six and there must be more than a hundred thousand persons in the whole world true said her mother smiling a great many more but all these persons are divided by grammarians into three classes first those who speak secondly those who are spoken to and thirdly those who are spoken of but mamma they can all of them speak except a few perhaps who may be dumb true but they all do not speak at once if some did not listen while others spoke they would speak to no purpose oh to be sure somebody must hear what they say or it would be useless for them to talk well those who speak are said to be of the first person if it is one person who speaks and speaks of himself alone he uses the pronoun i and says i am tired i have been walking if he speaks of more than one person the pronoun we is used as we are hungry we are going to dinner then i suppose said mary the people who are spoken to are of the second person yes and what pronoun would you use in speaking to people i say you if i speak to a single person as will you walk are you hungry and if i speak to several persons i use the pronoun i declare i do not know what pronoun i ought to use mamma i believe it is you also but can you be singular and plural both yes replied her mother properly speaking you is a plural pronoun but it has become customary to use it in the singular number also many years ago the pronoun thou was used when applied to a single person as thou hast looked at me but this pronoun is no longer used in common discourse except by quakers oh yes you know mr barker always says thou and thee it sounds so odd when he came here the other day he said to me is thy mother at home wilt thou tell her i am come to see her then in the bible mamma thou and thee are used yes we who are not quakers reserve those pronouns for sacred writings thinking that it gives a greater solemnity to the style and in conversation we use the pronoun you both in the singular and in the plural 
the third person is the person or thing spoken of in the singular number he she and it are used but they in the plural but how can it be a personal pronoun mamma for it does not stand for a person but for a thing things replied her mother are considered as being of the third person they cannot be of the first person because they cannot speak and they cannot be of the second person said mary laughing because they have no ears to hear so it would be nonsense speaking to them but it is true they may be of the third person because we speak about them we speak of frocks and shoes and dolls and tables and chairs well mary said her mother interrupting her i think you have given plenty of examples now try if you can give examples of three persons he she and it that is of the three third persons said mary he has gone out riding she came to see me it is very pretty very well you see that pronouns have genders as well as nouns oh yes he is masculine she is feminine and it is of the neuter gender the third person of the plural number they suits all genders equally well for you may say they are wise men they are pretty girls and they are sweet oranges mary's mother then took a pen and wrote down the personal pronouns as follows singular plural first person i we second person thou you third person he or she or it they but mamma you said that thou was no longer used except in religious books that is true but from old custom it still keeps its place in grammars mamma said mary i have just thought of something that puzzles me sadly when you say it rains what noun does it stand for does it mean that the clouds rain no for in that case you would say they rain not it rains you can never use a pronoun in the singular number for a noun in the plural the word it is used in this as in many other verbs without a reference to any noun and it seems to refer to some cause or state of things which makes the rain fall or water freeze or thunder roll or lightning flash but this is too difficult for you mary i shall therefore only tell you that the verbs it rains it freezes it thunders it lightens and all others which have no other nominative than the pronoun it are called impersonal because there are no persons belonging to them to be sure said mary laughing you cannot say i rain or you freeze or she thunders or they lighten well mary it is very fine now so go and take a run in the garden for it is very pleasant to run about after a lesson continuation of pronouns lesson six pray mamma said mary at the next lesson have pronouns cases like nouns yes replied her mother as they are put in place of nouns they must undergo all the changes which nouns do whether it be of number gender or case the pronouns i wrote down yesterday are of the nominative case for they are supposed either to do or to be something and if you bring them into a sentence you will find that they come before the verb as i eat thou sleepest he is happy we are tired you speak they walk now mary do you think you could find me out a pronoun in the possessive case what like the possessive case of nouns mamma written with an s and a comma before it it is the same case and has the same meaning but it is not written in the same manner how would you express yourself to say that you possessed anything this thimble for instance said she holding up mary's thimble i should say answered mary this thimble belongs to me that denotes possession it is true but it is in a rather roundabout way you use the phrase belongs to me instead of expressing the same meaning by a single pronoun is it not shorter and more easy to say this thimble is mine oh yes certainly said mary mine means belongs to me how stupid it was of me not to think of mine it is a word i repeat so often so then mine is a possessive pronoun for the first person singular yes but there is another possessive pronoun for the first person singular which is still shorter than mine 
if i say this is my book it means that i possess the book just the same as if i said this book is mine then there are two possessive pronouns for the first person singular yes and so there are for the second person singular thy and thine and also for the third which are his hers and its all these pronouns you know imply possession yes said mary you may say his hat her cap then if it is a thing that you are speaking of a tree for instance you may say its branches or its blossoms and of the table its legs but should not a comma be put before the s and its mamma as it is with nouns in the possessive case no the comma is not required because it is never plural the possessive case cannot therefore be mistaken for the plural number as it might be with nouns and pray what are the plural pronouns in this case are ours for the first person your or yours for the second person and their or theirs for the third person but why are there two possessive pronouns for each person inquired mary i should have thought that one would have been enough for if i say this is my hat or this hat is mine it seems to mean the same thing very nearly but not quite replied her mother mine is used when the noun comes before the pronoun as this hat is mine and my is used when the noun follows the pronoun as this is my hat and it is also the same with the third person feminine said her mother you may say this glove is hers or this is her glove but there is only one pronoun his for the third person masculine well i wonder there should not be two possessive pronouns for men as well as for women exclaimed mary it would certainly be more regular for you are obliged to use the word his both before and after the noun as that is his horse that horse is his i have heard sophie's nurse say his in sometimes mamma she invents a pronoun to follow the noun in order to make up for the one wanting but it is a very improper manner of speaking and you must be careful not to imitate it now try to give me some examples of the way in which the possessive pronouns plural are used let me see said mary thoughtfully you said they were are ours your yours their theirs then she went on thus will you walk in our garden this garden is ours you see mamma i have taken care to say our before garden and ours after it very well now for the second person plural if this is not your bonnet said mary which is yours shall i go on with the third person yes if you please their shoes are very pretty oh what pretty shoes are theirs now that you have finished the pronouns of the possessive case said her mother i will tell you what those of the objective case are of the singular number they are me thee him her it the pronouns all denote the object of the verb as give the book to me yes said mary book is the object given think again mary you have made a mistake there you are to point out the objective pronoun and not the noun mary thought again and then said oh yes i was quite wrong me is the object to whom the book is given speak to him him is the object spoken to and is in the objective case go with her stay with us walk with them then mamma all these pronouns follow the verb as the nouns do in the objective case so i shall easily be able to distinguish them from the nominative pronouns her mother then wrote out a table of personal pronouns with their several cases singular number first person nominative i possessive my mine objective me second person nominative thou possessive thy thine objective thee third person nominative male he female she possessive male his female her hers objective male his female her third person neuter nominative it possessive its objective it plural number 
first person nominative we possessive are ours objective us second person nominative you possessive your yours objective you third person nominative they possessive their theirs objective them you may get this table by heart mary now that you can understand it indeed mary replied she i should have found it a very hard task to have learnt it by heart before you had explained it for the words are so much alike in their meaning that i am sure i should have been sadly puzzled to recollect the order in which they were to be repeated we have now finished the personal pronouns said her mother but there are several other classes to be examined which we will reserve for another day to-morrow i shall treat you with a story i should like so much another story about the beautiful fairy instruction that will not be difficult to obtain said her mother for instruction is always ready to tell you a story when you will attend to her we will wait till to-morrow and then see what she will say to us the coat and buttons a fairy tale edward thought like you mary that he should be very glad to see the fairy again and one day that he was longing for it she suddenly appeared before him she showed him some of the curious pages in her glass book and then asked him what she should animate to give him an account of itself edward was much at a loss to determine he thought first of one thing then another and after being undecided for some time he said i think it would be very funny to hear my coat speak instruction touched his coat with her wand and then disappeared and for a few moments afterwards a soft voice issued from the bosom of his coat and spoke as follows i recollect once growing on the back of a sheep though edward expected to hear the coat speak he could not help starting back with surprise however he interrupted him saying i am afraid mr coat you do not know what you are talking about for coats do not grow nor do sheep wear coats i was only wool when i grew on the back of the sheep replied the voice and a very pleasant life we led together spending all the day in the green fields and resting at night on the grass sometimes indeed the sheep rubbed himself so roughly against the trees and shrubs that i was afraid of being torn off and sometimes the birds came and pecked off a few flakes of the wool to line their nests and make them soft and warm for their young but they took so little it was no great loss we had long led this quiet life one day there was a great alarm the shepherd and his dog drove all the sheep into a pen and then took them out one by one and washed them in a stream of water which ran close by the sheep on which i grew was sadly frightened when his turn came and for my part i could not imagine what they were going to do with me they rubbed and scrubbed me so much but when it was over i looked so delicately white that i was quite vain of my beauty and thought we were now to return and frisk and gamble in the meadows as we had done before but alas we were going to be parted for ever and i was never more to behold the fresh grass on which i had rested with so much pleasure instead of setting the sheep at liberty the shepherd took out a large pair of shears only imagine our terror the poor sheep i believe thought his head was going to be cut off and then began to bleat most piteously but the shepherd without attending to his cries held him down and began cutting me off close to his skin when the sheep found that the shears did not hurt him he remained quiet it was then my turn to be frightened it is true that the shears did not hurt me either because i could not feel but then i could not bear the thought of being parted from my dear friend the sheep for we had grown up together ever since he had been a little lamb the sheep who could field suffered even more than i did from the separation as soon as he was released he went about shivering with cold bleeding and moaning for the loss of his beloved fleece as for me i was packed in a bag with a great many other fleeces and sent to some mills where there were a great number of strange little things that were forever twisting and turning round they seized hold of us and pulled us and twisted us about in such a wonderful manner that at last we were all drawn out into worsted threads so unlike wool that i hardly knew myself again 
but it was still worse when some time afterwards they plunged me into a large copper of dark dirty looking water and when i was taken out instead of being white i was of a bright blue color and looked very beautiful well some time after this i was sent to the cloth mills and my threads were stretched in a machine called a loom and there i was woven into a piece of cloth i was then folded up and lay quiet for some time indeed said edward i think you required a little rest after going through so many changes soon after resumed the voice i was bought by a tailor and lay on a shelf of his shop then one day you and your papa came in and asked to see some cloth to make you a coat i was taken down and unfolded on the counter with several other pieces and if you remember you chose me on account of my beautiful color so i did said edward but you are not so bright a blue now as you were then something the worse for wear replied the coat if you stain me and cover me with dust that is your fault not mine but to conclude my story the tailor took out his enormous scissors which reminded me of the shears that had cut me from the sheep and cut me into the shape of a coat i was then sewn up by some journeymen who sat cross-legged on a table and when i was finished i was sent to you and ever since i have had the honor of covering the back of a human being instead of that of a sheep edward was much entertained with the story of the coat but these bright buttons he said are not made of wool have you nothing to say about them they were perfect strangers to me till they were sewn on said the coat i know nothing about them they must speak for themselves upon this the whole row of little buttons raised their sharp voices at once which sounded like the jingling of so many little bells this made such a confused noise that edward could not distinguish a word they said he therefore in an imperative tone commanded silence and laying hold of one of them with his finger and thumb he said come mr button let me hear the story from you while all the rest remain quiet pleased by this preference the face of the button shone brighter than usual and in a small shrill but distinct voice he began thus we lay for a long time underground not bright and shining as you see us now but mixed up with dirt and rubbish how long we remained there it is impossible for me to say for as it was always dark there was no telling day from night nor any means of counting weeks and years but could you not hear the church clock strike said edward that would have told you how time passed oh no replied the button if we had had ears we could not have heard so deep we were buried in the bowels of the earth oh dear how dismal that must have been exclaimed edward not for us who neither thought nor felt replied the button well after having lain there for ages perhaps all at once there was an opening made in the ground and the men came down where we lay and dug us up they talked about a fine vein of copper i am glad we have reached it at last said they it will repay us all our labor they then put us into a basket and we were taken up above ground and into daylight the glare of the light was so strong to us who had been so long in utter darkness that i thought it would almost have blinded us well after that we were put into a fiery furnace i am sure that you must have been glad then that you could not feel said edward and were you burnt to ashes oh no replied the button copper is a metal and metals will not burn but we were melted and as the earth and rubbish which were mixed with us does not melt we ran out through some holes that were made on purpose for us to escape from our dirty companions who were not fit society for us we were then imprisoned in moulds where we were left to cool and become solid again men then came with hammers and beat us till we became quite flat every time they struck us we hallooed out as loud as we could and our cries resounded to a great distance but they went on all the same what exclaimed edward had you voices to cry out no replied the button but do you not know that if you strike against metal it rings or resounds the sound of a bell is nothing but the metal tongue striking against the inside of a bell and you know what a noise that makes just then the dinner bell began ringing and edward cried out that it does indeed well continued the button after we had been beaten into flat sheets 
we were sent to the turners who cut us into little bits and then placed us one after another into a strange kind of machine called a lathe he held us there while he turned a wheel with his foot so fast that it would have made one giddy that is if you had a head said edward laughing when i was taken out of the lathe i was quite surprised to see what a pretty round shape i had i wondered what was to be done to me next for there was nothing by which i could be sewn on to a coat i did not think that i was to be made into a button but supposed i was intended for a piece of money yes a round flat button is something like a halfpenny said edward but you were much too small for that yes and i soon found out that i was to be a button for they fastened a tail to me and rubbed me for a great length of time till i became very bright i was then stuck with the rest of us on a sheet of thick white paper oh i remember cried edward you were all stuck to the paper when the tailor showed you to papa and me and you looked quite beautiful edward then listened in expectation of the button continuing his story but it was ended and his voice was gone from this time it was observed that edward took more care of his coat than usual and when from any accident he dirtied it he brushed it clean and now and then he was seen rubbing the buttons to make them shine bright end of chapter fourteen Chapter Fifteen of Mary's Grammar by Jane Marset. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Jennifer Dalman. Relative Pronouns, Lesson Seven. At the next lesson of grammar, Mary came skipping into the room with her book in her hand, saying, "Now, Mamma, for the rest of the pronouns." The next class of pronouns, said her mother, are called relative because they relate to some word said before. There are but three relative pronouns who which and that they will be very easy to remember mamma being so few but mary i do not mean that you should remember them like a parrot you must understand them and then you will remember them equally well were there few or many in order to understand them you must know to what words they relate if i say the man who brought me a letter to what word does who relate to the man certainly very well I will now give you a more complicated example. The tree that was blown down yesterday fell near Charles, who was sadly frightened. That relates to the tree, said Mary, but who relates to Charles being frightened? Now, Mamma, she added, it is my turn to give an example. Well, my dear, think of one, and try to introduce in it all three pronouns. Mary thought for a long time, looking very grave all the while and at last she said do you remember the pretty doll that grandmamma gave me which has a pink frock i have lent it to sophie who is very fond of playing with it very well but what made you look so grave my dear i expected you to say something very serious instead of talking about playing with dolls oh mamma it is so difficult to find out how to place the pronouns that one cannot help looking grave even when one is thinking of something amusing well now mary said her mother you may be really grave for i am going to teach you a very hard word mary made a long face and listened with great attention to her mother who proceeded the word to which the pronoun relates is called the antecedent which means something that goes before can you remember that word oh yes it is not so difficult as i thought when you told me to be so grave I shall remember the word antecedent, because it's like the antechamber, before you go into the drawing room. Now then, said her mother, I will give you a sentence in which you shall find out the nouns that are the antecedents to their relative pronouns. The sheep which were feeding on the common were scared by a little boy who ran hallooing after them, and the dog that guarded them had much ado to bring them back. Sheep, said Mary, after a thoughtful pause, is the antecedent of which? boy is the antecedent of who and dog is the antecedent of that how foolish it was continued she for such large animals as sheep to be afraid of a little boy and pray mamma have the relative pronouns numbers and genders and cases like the personal pronouns which and that replied her mother never change but who has three cases the possessive case of who is whose and the objective whom thus you might ask who called here yesterday 
and i should answer a lady whom i saw but whose name i forget can you tell me the cases of these three pronouns yes i believe i can said mary in the first place they all relate to the lady who is nominative whom must be the objective because the lady was the object spoken to and whose is the possessive case because the lady must have a name though you forgot it mamma said mary laughing true replied her mother the pronouns who whose and whom are used in general for rational beings that is men women and children which is more correctly applied to animals and things you do not say the horse who trotted or the tree who is in blossom but the horse that trotted and the tree which is in blossom and would it be wrong to say the tree that is in blossom no the pronoun that may be applied to all sorts of nouns for you may say the child that played with the flower that i gathered and the box that i opened with equal propriety but as the pronoun who is in general confined to rational beings it is considered more appropriate to them than the pronoun that who whose and whom when they are used to ask questions are called interrogative pronouns as who is that to whom did you speak whose carriage is that i shall always know them said mary by the note of interrogation we shall now finish our lesson continued her mother but we must have one more on pronouns before we come to our story the thought of the story always gave mary courage to get through the difficult parts of her lesson it is true that parsing the story obliged her sometimes to work hard but she knew that nothing could be well learned without taking pains then she was really fond of learning new things and she thought any painstaking better than being ignorant end of chapter fifteen chapter sixteen of mary's grammar by jane marcet this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by jennifer dolman demonstrative pronouns lesson eight the next class of pronouns are the demonstrative they are this these that those what and which they are called demonstrative because they demonstrate or mark out the noun before which they are placed as this orange is very sweet yes said mary this marks out the noun orange which is very sweet i will now give you another example said her mother that apple is sour now let me see if you can find out one mary these plums are ripe said mary those nuts are hard which when interrupting herself she added i cannot tell what which points out which book will you read in mary what fruit do you like best but mamma what and which do not seem to me to point out the noun as the other demonstrative pronouns do when you said this orange is sweet and that apple is sour this and that showed which particular orange is it that is sweet and which particular apple it is that is sour but if i ask which book am i to read in which so far from pointing out a book means i do not know and so ask you to tell me and it is just the same with what fruit do you like best if the pronoun what showed what fruit i liked best i need not to ask you the question her mother smiled and said your observation shows that you think about it mary what you have said is very true which and what do not point out any particular object but they ask you to point out or demonstrate which or what particular thing you are inquiring after and for this reason perhaps have been generally called demonstrative pronouns but they are sometimes and i think more properly called interrogative pronouns because they ask questions but mamma there is another thing that puzzles me you said that which was a relative pronoun can it be a demonstrative pronoun also yes replied her mother but it cannot be both at the same time for it has different meanings as a relative or as a demonstrative pronoun when it relates to an antecedent as the book which i read in it is a relative pronoun but when it points out a noun that follows as which book will you read in it is demonstrative or interrogative because it asks questions but we have said so much of which and what that we have almost forgotten the other demonstrative pronouns let me see whether you can introduce this that these and those into a sentence mary thought a little and then said 
i am going to put the room in order mamma i will place these chairs round this table and put those prints on that table very well do you understand the difference between this table and that table there is a great deal of difference said mary looking at them one is square and the other is round and this table is large and that is small and do the pronouns this and that point out the difference between the tables oh no said mary laughing this does not mean a large round table and that a small square one for if you said this table and that table without me seeing them i should not know at all what shape they were then what does this table and that table mean this replied mary means the table nearest to us and that the table further off ah now you are right said her mother and i dare say that you will be able to tell me what these and those mean the same thing mamma only they are plural instead of singular these chairs are nearer to us than those prints i like these apples better than those i ate yesterday mary then ran to the piano and began playing a waltz her mother waited patiently till she had finished it but then she began another and her mother inquired how many waltzes she meant to play before she went on with her lesson only two replied mary i wanted to tell you that i do not like this waltz so well as that i played first her mother laughed at her example and said so then you are practicing your lesson of grammar on the piano but mamma said mary i have got into a puzzle with my example of the waltzes they were both played on the same piano so how can one be further off than the other they are both at the same distance in the point of place my dear certainly but not in point of time for you played the one before you played the other then there are two further offs said mary yes one relates to time the other to place you may say next year is a distant time and york is a distant place oh yes said mary the one means that there is a great deal of ground between you and york and the other stop mary said her mother interrupting her let us come to a clear understanding of what one distance means before we explain the other if i say america is a very distant place there is something else besides ground between us and america yes a great deal of water all the atlantic ocean well i mean the quantity of land and water there is between us and the place and if i should say the moon is very distant how would you explain it for there is neither land nor water between us and the moon that i know of no but it is a very long way off for there is a great empty space between us and the moon or at least nothing but air in it well my dear all these distances whether they consist of land water air or merely an empty place can be expressed by one single word space i may say there is a great space between us and america and a still greater between us and the moon it is very convenient said mary to have one word to say so many things and are small distances called spaces too yes you may say the space between those two chairs or those books will not take up much space on the shelf oh dear mamma cried mary with the pleased look of having made a discovery i have just thought of some little tiny spaces much smaller still in music books you know there are five lines and four spaces between them and she pointed them out to her mother in a book which lay open on the piano yes mary and they are so called because they are the spaces or distances between the lines in regard to time distance also means far off but it means far off in time i may say next thursday is a distant day or next year is very distant and the next century is more distant still i understand the difference very well now mamma then can you tell me how you measure the distance of space why said mary pausing to reflect i have seen you measure the distance from one end of the room to the other with a foot measure and a yard measure is longer and will measure quicker then i remember when you measured the length of the gravel walk you did it with a pack thread true but i measured the pack thread first otherwise i would not have known how long the walk was but mamma if you were to measure the space between this place and london it would be very tedious to do it with a foot measure a yard or even a string for you know it is seventy miles miles she repeated a new thought suddenly occurring 
miles are the very thing that is i mean milestones for the distance from here to london is measured by milestones but recollect said her mother the ground must be measured first in order to ascertain where the milestones are to be placed now can you find out how to measure the distance of time no indeed said mary feet and yards and miles will not measure time can you not tell me how long it will be from this time to your dinner time oh yes it is now ten o'clock and i dine at two so there are four hours from this to my dinner time you see then you can measure time by a clock even with less trouble than you can measure space by a foot or yard time is divided into seconds minutes hours days and years and a clock or a watch is the instrument for the purpose of measuring time they will do very well for hours and even days perhaps but for years mamma surely there ought to be a greater measure to measure years with something like the milestones that measure very long spaces and so there is mary when you are old enough to understand it you will find out there is something like milestones in the sky to measure time with mary stared with astonishment she longed extremely to know what sort of things these milestones could be she looked up inquisitively but could discover nothing that bore any resemblance to milestones in the sky she then entreated her mother to tell her what it was her mother smiled and pointing to the sun said that is one of the milestones oh mamma you are joking now exclaimed mary no indeed my dear the sun served to measure time long before clocks and watches were invented and even now the laborers in the field who have not watches learn by observing whereabouts the sun is in the sky when it is time for them to begin their day's work or when it is twelve o'clock for them to go to dinner when you are older mary you will learn that the sun and stars are indeed the only true measures of time and that our clocks and watches when they go wrong are set according to them but this is too difficult for you now mary besides it does not belong to a lesson of grammar indeed we have been talking of other subjects almost the whole of the lesson oh but mamma i think i have learned a great deal about time and space and i am sure it has amused me well that must serve as an apology for deviating so much from our subject it is too late to return to grammar to-day so we will reserve the remainder of the pronouns for the next lesson continuation of demonstrative pronouns lesson nine well mary said her mother we must keep close to our subject to-day in order to finish the demonstrative pronouns i remember mamma that i was just going to ask you a question about them when time and space interrupted us is the word that both a relative and a demonstrative pronoun as the word which is for you have named that in both of these classes of pronouns yes my dear it is but the meaning of the word in one class is so different from its meaning in the other that you will not easily confound them it must be quite different indeed for the relative pronoun that refers to some noun gone before and called its antecedent and the demonstrative pronoun points out some noun that follows after do i not recollect well mamma she said with a look of self-approbation very well said her mother but i think the observations we made in our last lesson on which has helped you out a little i will place the two that's in one sentence and we shall see whether you will not be able to distinguish the relative from the demonstrative is that work amusing i mean the work that you are doing the first that said mary is demonstrative because it is placed before work to show what work you mean and the second that is relative and work is its antecedent now mamma let me put two that's in a sentence and observing a horse pass the window she said that horse is the same that galloped by yesterday very well but can you tell me what is the antecedent to the relative that i do not know said mary for horse belongs to the demonstrative pronoun so i suppose i am wrong no the antecedent though it is not named is perfectly understood when you say the same it is clear the same horse is meant oh yes said mary the word is left out as you told me in the last lesson now mary what will you say when i tell you that the word that besides being both a relative and a demonstrative pronoun is also sometimes a conjunction 
oh mamma exclaimed mary that is too bad it must be very puzzling for one word to have three different meanings it requires at least sense to understand and attention to be able to distinguish them more perhaps than a little girl of your age can be expected to have well but let me try cried mary who was ambitious of not being considered as a very little girl pray give me an example mamma here is one replied her mother i am so tired that i can hardly stand what is the meaning of that in this sentence it does not relate to any noun so it cannot be a relative pronoun it does not mark out any noun so it cannot be a demonstrative pronoun i suppose therefore it is a conjunction yes that joins two parts of a sentence together as i am so tired that i can hardly stand and shows their connection which is that i can hardly stand because i am so tired now let me find out an example mamma she is so sorry for her fault that i do not think she will ever do so again suppose mamma that we were to put the three that's all in one sentence but that is too difficult for me you must do it mamma considered for some little time how to introduce so many that's and at length said fetch me the nosegay that i gathered this morning that i may put it in that flower pot the first that said mary is a relative pronoun and the nosegay to which it relates is its antecedent the second that is a conjunction which joins the two parts of the sentence together and the last that is a demonstrative pronoun pointing out the particular flower pot you want i must say you have explained it very well said her mother there are some few other pronouns but i think you have had quite enough of them for a girl of your age but don't forget mamma that you promised me a story after the pronouns the next day her mother began as follows curiosity ellen forrester was a little girl of amiable disposition but she had one fault which was likely to spoil all her good qualities this was curiosity she was so eager to know whatever happened to her friends that she wearied them by her questions if she thought they talked lower than usual she contrived to get within hearing and listened attentively to know if they were not whispering secrets thus she was beginning to be considered an inquisitive and prying girl and to be avoided by her companions she was once or twice found secretly listening and was obliged to make some awkward excuse but she had never gone so far to invent one she had never been guilty of a falsehood her mother who loved her tenderly had tried various modes of curing her of this fault but without success one day she sent her into her room to fetch some work and ellen saw a letter lying on the table she felt a strong desire to look at the direction it was in her grandmamma's handwriting i wonder thought ellen mamma did not tell me of it there is some secret in it i dare say this increased her curiosity she turned the letter over and saw that the seal was broken and that the letter though folded was not closed so that in turning it over in every direction it became unfolded and her own name caught her eye she was now convinced that the letter contained a secret about herself and her curiosity was more and more excited she knew it would be very wrong to read the letter yet she still kept it in her hands and without as she persuaded herself intending to read it she could not avoid seeing these words you will give it to ellen only if she could see no more without decidedly opening the letter what could it be that her grandmamma was going to give her her desire to know was almost irresistible and then the terrible if increased it so much that she lost all control over herself tore open the letter and read as follows i sent a painting box as a new year's gift to my dear ellen i know she has long wished to have one and she has made such progress in drawing that i think she should soon be able to color her sketches but as i consider it of much greater importance that she should improve in character than in drawing i beg that you will give it to ellen only if during the whole month previous to new year's day her curiosity has not led her into the commission of any fault no not one cried ellen her eyes sparkling with joy it was but yesterday mamma said i had been good for a whole month but soon the conscious color rushed to her cheeks the letter dropped from her hands she knew that opening it was a fault by which the present would be forfeited 
what was to be done she bitterly repented her curiosity but her curiosity still prevailed and she could not help looking round the room to see if she could discover the box there was something on the dressing-table covered with a handkerchief she lifted it up and beheld the painting-box beautifully inlaid and of a much larger size than she had expected she raised the lid and beneath it lay all the gay colors in soft graduation of tints and beside them a number of camel hair brushes of various sizes she opened the drawer beneath and saw a set of small saucers placed in rows and intended for the colors when rubbed up she was at first so much taken up with the box that she forgot her fault but as soon as reflection returned she trembled with apprehension alas what can i do she thought how can i conceal my fault from my dear mamma to whom i tell everything and how could i enjoy the box if she gave it to me after what i have done she was thus hesitating when her mother called to her from below and asked her why she did not come back with the work she had sent her for ellen shut the box hastily threw the handkerchief over it folded up the letter and ran downstairs so fast that she had well nigh fallen this she thought might account for her agitation and confusion but her mother was too clear-sighted she knew by ellen's conscious look that she had seen the box and read the letter her heart sunk within through grief at her daughter's fault but she said nothing thinking it right to consider how she should act and willing to allow ellen time and opportunity to confess her fault the morning passed away almost in silence ellen learnt her lessons very imperfectly she made several mistakes in reading and hemmed her work on the wrong side her suffering was evident and over and over again did she resolve to get rid of her curiosity she could not have had a more favorable opportunity had she had but fortitude to sacrifice the present and confess her fault but her eyes had dwelt with such delight on the beauties of the box and the possession of it appeared to her such extreme happiness that she had not the courage to give it up oh why did my hateful curiosity make me uncover it said she to herself if i had not seen it i should not feel so sorry to give it up oh why did i read the letter it was that which did all the harm she was still hesitating what to do when three days after on coming into her mother's room she kissed her and wished her a happy new year ellen was not aware that the new year was so near at hand she blushed and knew not what to say her color rose still higher when her mother showed her the box told her the conditions on which it was given and then continued in a serious and impressive manner but with a look of anxious tenderness as if she were entreating rather than inquiring i hope i can have sufficient confidence in you my dear ellen to make you the judge of your own conduct tell me whether you deserve this box or not ellen could not resist this appeal she was touched by the confidence her mother placed in her and her beseeching look went straight to her heart she sunk on her knees hid her face in her mother's lap and sobbed out oh no no i do not deserve it her mother raised her up and embraced her with eagerness while her eyes sparkled with joy my dear child she said you have relieved me from a dreadful apprehension i know your fault you have been guilty of concealing it for three days and if in the end you had denied it i should have been wretched for i should have been convinced that your insatiable curiosity had destroyed the natural candor and openness of your disposition but you have in part atoned for your fault by your free confession and the sacrifice of the box will i hope make a lasting impression on your mind ellen overcome by her emotion cried out oh mamma i do not care for the box now i only care for your forgiveness and i am so sorry to have made you unhappy but i did not think you knew anything about it you cannot read my countenance as well as i can yours replied her mother or rather you do not observe it i am sure ellen you have not seen me smile for these last three days as for you i was aware of what you had done the moment you returned with the work she then took ellen out walking to compose her spirits and when they returned she said now let us pack up this unfortunate box and return it to grandmamma 
and i will write her word what has happened we must have no concealment from her ellen fetched the paper and pack thread she could not give a last look at the beautiful colors without some feeling of regret but the more she suffered by parting with the box the more she felt assured that she should in future not give way to her curiosity as she tied the last knot she said i hope it will not always be an unfortunate box for i do think it will cure me forever i wish it may replied her mother and if so we may perhaps some day or other see it back again End of chapter 16chapter seventeen of mary's grammar by jane marset this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by jennifer dahlman verbs lesson ten in our former lesson on verbs when you were a little girl mary said her mother i taught you the meaning of a verb generally and explained to you the three kinds of verbs active passive and neuter now that you are a great girl comparatively speaking she said smiling i must teach you the four different modes or manner of expressing a verb modes of expressing a verb repeated mary i cannot understand that without an explanation mamma and i doubt whether you would understand it if i attempted to explain it now so i think it would be better to wait till you have made some acquaintance with these several modes they will then be much easier to explain than when they are quite strange to you i am sure mamma if it is easier for you to explain it is much easier for me to understand when i know something about them then there is nothing so dry and hard as a definition i think it should always come at the end instead of at the beginning that may do for children said her mother but it would not satisfy grown people who are able to understand a definition the pronouns you have lately been learning are a good introduction to verbs for without the help of persons we cannot understand a verb if i say to write to talk to be beaten you know the meaning of the verb but you cannot tell who it is that writes or walks or is beaten you are ignorant whether it is one person or many and whether the person is masculine or feminine or neuter perhaps mamma interrupted mary for you know a pen may write and a carpet may be beaten very true my dear you see therefore that either nouns or personal pronouns are necessary to tell us who it is that acts the mere name of the verb with the little word too before it is called the infinitive mode of the verb because it defines nothing and simply expresses the action without saying who did it or when or how it was done as to sleep to talk to be tired then i think mamma the infinitive mode seems to teach one nothing at all little more than the name of the verb replied her mother but you will find by and by that it is more useful than you imagine well if instead of saying to write you say he writes what does that mean i know said mary that he is a single person of the masculine gender and that he is the person who writes so the little word he points out the person the number and the gender oh he tells us a great deal more than two does i dare say it is another mode mamma it is replied her mother but tell me does not he point out the case also yes he is the nominative case for he does something he writes he comes before the verb which commands it to be nominative and does not he writes tell you also the time at which he writes inquired her mother what do you mean mamma cried mary looking surprised at what o'clock he writes oh no time and grammar my dear said her mother smiling does not mean the hour the day or the year he writes means that he is writing now at this present time whether it is twelve o'clock or three o'clock or whatever the hour may be yes to be sure said mary or whatever day sunday monday or tuesday or whatever year it may happen to be he writes always means now how much more the little word he tells us than the little word too does for it tells us the person the number the gender the case and the time the word he mary does not point out the time why mamma you have just said that he writes is now the present time that is true he writes is the present time but it is the word writes and not the word he that points out the time the pronoun he is used in all the times if i say he wrote a letter yesterday what time is that 
that is the time that is past and gone for yesterday is over and will never come back again but you see mary that it is the change in the verb from writes to wrote and not the pronoun he which points out the past time and if i say he shall write to-morrow what does that mean oh to-morrow is not past and gone said mary it is the time that is to come it will be here soon mamma very well you must remember these three times which grammarians call tenses they are the present time which is now the past time which has gone by and the future time which is to come i ride to-day that is the present time i rode yesterday that is the past and i shall ride to-morrow that is the future but you say ride for the present and for the future too mamma when you say i shall ride the verb ride does not change replied her mother it is the word shall which points out the future tense shall is the sign of the future tense just as too is the sign of the infinitive mode but mamma if you say i shall ride next week or next year it is the time to come as well as to-morrow is it not certainly i mentioned to-morrow only because i thought it would make the sense clearer to you to point out some particular time so then said mary all the time that is to come from to-morrow to a hundred or even a thousand years is future time yes from the next minute to all eternity oh what a time exclaimed mary with a long-drawn breath for ever and for ever it is of all lengths replied her mother if you say i shall go in a moment the future time is not very long no indeed said mary laughing a moment is short enough but mary i have not yet told you the name of the mode we have been talking of and i think you are by this time sufficiently acquainted with it for me to explain it to you oh yes said mary i know a great deal about it this mode has all the three persons both singular and plural and the three tenses and i like it much better than the infinitive mode pray what is it called it is called the indicative mode because it indicates or points out that the verb is positively done without any condition hesitation or objection but i cannot understand how there can be any other mode of doing a verb mamma for either the verb must be positively done or not done you cannot do it by halves can you i have known people mary who cannot always make up their mind whether they will do a verb or not for instance this morning when willie was asking you to go and play with him in the garden you answered if i go i shall not have time to finish my work and then when he continued pressing you to go you said i would go if you promised not to keep me long and he having agreed to this condition you said well then mamma may we go oh but mamma i was talking about doing the verb and not positively doing it true replied her mother that was not the indicative mode but you know mamma i did go with willie at last for when you said yes i put by my work and went directly that was the indicative or positive mode and is talking about whether you will do a verb or not another mode mamma yes it is but we have not yet done with the indicative mode let me hear whether you can repeat the three tenses or times of the indicative mode in the verb to walk but use the pronoun i instead of he mary looked grave and after a little thought said i walk that is now i walked that means the past time and i shall walk that is the future very well mary but i and he are not the only persons who can walk in our lesson on pronouns you may remember we said that there were three persons singular and as many plural and each of these persons may be the nominative or agent of the verb as well as he or i oh yes all the persons can not only walk but they can run and dance too said mary beginning to skip about well when you have finished dancing yourself said mother suppose that you were to try to repeat the verb to dance begin with the first person i and go on with those that follow this seemed to mary a difficult task and one that required a good deal of reflection so she sat down and took some little time to think and recollect who the several pronouns were and then said 
I dance, you dance, he dance. No, it must be he dances, said she, interrupting herself. Yes, replied her mother. The third person singular is dances. Or if it is a woman or a little girl, said Mary, it is she dances. Or if it is a doll or a puppet, added her mamma, it is it dances. And all three are the third person singular. But remember I told you that thou continues to be used by grammarians for the second person singular, though in conversation and in writing we say you in its stead. Now for the plural. Mary repeated, we dance, you dance, they dance. Very well. That is all in the present time. Do you think you can tell me the past time? I must think of some past time, said Mary. Suppose it was yesterday. She then continued, I danced yesterday, thou dancedest yesterday, he danced yesterday, we danced, you danced, they danced. I mean that they all danced yesterday, mamma, but there is no use in repeating it every time. You see that I did not forget to say thou instead of you for the second person singular, and then I was forced to say dancedest, else it would not have sounded right. Well, now for the future, our time to come, said her mother. Oh, that will be easy enough, said Mary, for I know the sign of the future is shall, so I will only have to put shall before dance, and go on as I did with the past time. Only take care, Mary, said her mother, smiling, not to put the word yesterday after the verb, as you did in the past tense. Oh, no, it would be a foolish thing to say, I shall dance yesterday. Let me see, what future time shall I choose? It shall be this evening. Then she repeated, I shall dance this evening. Thou shalt dance this evening. He shall dance. We shall dance. You shall dance. They shall dance. All of them this evening. Very well, my dear, said her mother. But I must tell you that there are two words that are signs of the future tense. Shall and will. If you say I will dance, it means that you are to dance at some future time also. Then shall and will mean the same thing, Mamma. As signs of the future tense they do, but their meaning is very different in other respects, according as they are placed in the sentence. Of this, I will give you an amusing example. There was a foreigner once in this country who fell into a river, and not knowing how to swim, he was sadly afraid of being drowned. In his distress, he called out, I will be drowned, and nobody shall come and help me. Some country people who were at work in the adjoining field thought it was a joke and began to laugh. But finding by his struggles he was really in want of assistance, they went and got him out of the water. And on coming to an explanation, they found that he had intended to call for assistance and to say, I shall be drowned, and nobody will come and help me. After Mary had laughed heartily at this anecdote, her mother said that she had learnt enough of the verbs this morning. She desired her to endeavor to remember the three tenses of the indicative mode, promising at the next lesson to teach her another mode. Continuation of Verbs, Lesson 11 Well, Mama, said Mary, I cannot think of what the other modes can be besides the infinitive, which tells you so little, and the indicative, which tells you so much. The next mode, answered her mother, is called the subjunctive because some circumstance or condition is subjoined to it. I will give you an example. For instance, if you ride, the horse will throw you. The condition subjoined to your riding is that the horse would throw you. That is not a very agreeable circumstance. No, indeed, said Mary. Or you might say, continued her mother, if I were to ride, I should be tired. That is not quite so alarming a condition, said Mary. Well, pray go on with your conditions, Mama. Her mother went on. If he rides, he will be too late for dinner. If we ride, it must be early. If you ride, you may get wet. If they had ridden, they might have enjoyed the fine weather. Well, said Mary, I am glad to hear that there is a pleasant circumstance subjoined at last. The little verbs may, might, should, would, could, her mother told her, were all signs of the subjunctive mode for they all expressed uncertainty and required an if before them as if i may ride will you lend me your horse if he knew how to ride he would not have been thrown if they should go they will not be home in time 
oh mamma exclaimed mary that was the mode in which i was talking to willie about going to play with him in the garden i remember i said if i should go and if i may go and all the little hesitating verbs and then you know mary you made your condition that he should not detain you long and so i did replied mary looking surprised well how could i talk so much about the subjunctive mode without knowing a word about it observe mary said her mother that in this mode the agents do not say that they do ride or have ridden or will ride as they do in the indicative mode but that they might or could or would or may under such or such conditions yes mamma though they talk so much about it there is not one of them that does ride i like the indicative mode much the best for there you positively do ride or have ridden or shall ride without so many ifs to stop you now then you understand the difference between the indicative and the subjunctive modes said her mother oh yes in the indicative all the persons ride without any condition or anybody trying to prevent them while the subjunctive is all made up of hesitation and uncertainty yes said her mother the indicative is the positive mode the subjunctive the conditional mode i know what i should call it mamma i think it is the uncertain or doubting mode for they can none of them make up their minds whether they will ride or not yet you should not find fault with their hesitation said her mother for their riding or not depends often on other people or circumstances rather than on themselves then i suppose said mary laughing the persons in the subjunctive mode are children who can only do what they are allowed and then you know mamma it is no wonder there should be so many conditions as to the riding the subjunctive mode her mother said applies quite as much to grown people as to children a man may say if you will choose me for your king i will govern you with wisdom and justice or a general may say to his soldiers if you should disobey my orders you would be severely punished or mamma you might say to me if you are a good girl for a week to come i should be very much pleased but the little word if mamma is not a verb is it no it is a conjunction which expresses doubt or uncertainty other conjunctions are sometimes used in the subjective mode as though and that thus if you would say though he should speak the truth they would not believe him i wish that you would lend me a book that i might read the subjunctive mode may indeed be used without any sign you may always know it to be a subjunctive when the verb is not positive but conditional or depending on some other circumstance i will give you the subjunctive mode of the verb to dance i may or might or should would or could thou mayest he may we may you may they may dance if you would let me or if anything else said mary as if i choose or if i go to the ball or if i have a partner well mary i think we have had enough of the ifs now so let us proceed to the last mode which is called the imperative it commands and forbids as come here learn your lesson go away oh what a tone of authority this mode has said mary you need not be in great awe of it however mary for besides commanding it also begs and entreats beggars speak in this mode when they say pray give me a halfpenny and children when they ask pardon and say forgive me what a strange mode cried mary at one time to order and command and at another to beg and pray but mamma are there no persons in this mode no pronouns oh yes returned her mother the same as in other modes this is the imperative mode let me dance let us dance dance thou dance you let him dance let them dance how odd said mary dance thou and dance you people never say so in talking mamma no replied she it is used only in religious books or poetry when the language is very elevated in familiar speaking or writing you say dance write speak but then how is it known which of the three persons is meant the person who speaks is you know always the first person and the person spoken to the second when you say dance you speak to the person whom you bid to dance 
the pronoun you therefore though not mentioned is understood and it is only in the second persons both singular and plural that the pronoun is not used it was your saying come here give me a halfpenny without using any pronoun that made me think there were no persons to this mode it is curious said her mother that illiterate people speak most grammatically in this mode for they say go you away get you gone they learn grammar by ear and make the verbs more regular than they really are i have now explained to you the four modes of the verb do you remember their names and meaning oh yes said mary first comes the infinitive mode which means nothing at all except the name of the verb with the little word to before it as to speak to write but mary if it is a very desirable thing to have a mode which points out so much as the indicative mode does it is also very convenient to have a mode which expresses only the name of the verb if i say she will learn to read there are in that sentence two verbs learn and read the first is in the indicative mode she will learn and tells you that the nominative she is of the third person singular number feminine gender and will learn marks the future tense oh how much is said in those three little words exclaimed mary well then the second verb to read does nothing more than to name the verb which is all that is required for as we know it is the same person who will both learn and read it would be a loss of time and of words to point out all these circumstances over again so you see mary that when there are two verbs with the same nominative it is very convenient to have so short a mode of expressing the second verb as the infinitive is it is indeed said mary i will try to find out two verbs with the same nominative you have done it already my dear try to find are two verbs the first in the indicative the second in the infinitive mode that was found out by chance said mary but now i will try to find out one by thinking and after a little reflection she said i should like to eat observe mary said her mother i should like is not the indicative but the subjunctive mode but the infinitive follows it equally well as the subjunctive mode points out the person number and so on but that little word too puzzles me mamma it is a sign of the infinitive mode but it is a preposition not a verb when it is used as a sign of the infinitive mode replied her mother you must consider it as forming part of the verb for it is not used in the sense of the preposition before the noun when you say to a house or to a man it means approaching or going to a house or a man but when to is used as a sign of the infinitive mode as to write to read to dance it means doing something not approaching anything now tell me what is the next mode the indicative said mary which is the wisest and means the most of them all for it speaks positively and without hesitation then it has three tenses and three personal pronouns both singular and plural in short in that mode the verb is done completely then follows the subjunctive mode or as i call it the doubting mode which has all the persons the same as in the indicative mode but they do not get on half so well they each declare that they would do the verb if they could or would or might it is always future time with them i think mamma continued mary laughing for as they never do the action there is no present time and as they never did the action there can be no past time either grammarians however contrive to make both a past and a future time in this mode but it is not necessary to trouble you about them well said mary the last is the imperative mode which is sometimes so haughty and commanding and at other times so humble and subservient you have described the modes in your own way mary said her mother which though not very elegant or perhaps very accurate shows me that you understand them pretty well in speaking or writing you must always take care that the verb agrees with the noun or pronoun in person and number and not say as some illiterate people do i likes fruit they lives in london oh no mamma i knew that before i learned grammar by the sound but now i know the reason of it it is not the first person singular 
but the third person that ends in s he likes and he lives much more grammar said her mother is learned by ear than we are aware of but it is not always correct end of chapter seventeen chapter eighteen of mary's grammar by jane marcet this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by jennifer dalman continuation of verbs lesson twelve participles the following morning when mary went to her mother for her lesson she said well mamma we have not done with the verbs yet have we oh no replied her mother far from it besides the four modes there belongs to a verb two words called participles because they partake of the quality of the adjective as well as the verb the participles of the verb to dance are dancing danced the first is called the active participle the second the passive participle i think said mary they should be called the present and the past participles for dancing is the present time and dance the past but what have they to do with adjectives mamma the participles are often used as adjectives did you never hear of a dancing bear oh yes dancing is an adjective there because it shows the quality of the bear you may say a learned man and learned besides an adjective is a passive participle of the verb to learn but when these participles are used as verbs how can you put pronouns before them you cannot say i dancing he dancing they dancing no replied her mother when the participle is used as a verb you require the help of another verb as you will see by and by now try to find me out some participles mary going mamma is not that the active participle of the verb to go her mother nodded assent well mamma i will now act the two participles and she walked deliberately towards the door i suppose that means going mary yes said mary who then opened the door and walking out of the room said now i am gone that is the passive participle presently she came back tripping into the room and said now i am a coming a coming repeated her mother affecting surprise what sort of thing can that be it is not a thing mamma it is an active participle of the verb to come no indeed replied her mother pray what part of speech is ah mary pleased that she recollected what it was began repeating from her grammar ah is an article put before a noun when her mother interrupted her saying if ah is an article placed before a noun coming must be a noun and i never saw or heard of such a thing as a coming it is very natural that i should wonder what it can be can you tell me whether it is a person or a thing mary tried to laugh when she discovered that her mamma was joking but she could not for she was vexed at the blunder she had made well continued her mother seeing mary look grave we will joke no more coming it is true is the present participle of the verb to come but then you must not put an article before it mary or you will make me fancy it is a noun i have given you a little lesson about it which i am sure you will remember it is a very common error saying a coming and a going but it is always bad grammar to put an article before a participle well now that you are acquainted with the participles and the four modes of a verb let me hear if you can conjugate one what is conjugate mamma it is to repeat a verb through with its persons its tenses its modes and its participles as we did the verb to dance yes but the conjugation was not complete as you were not acquainted with the participles try to repeat the verb to go mary stood upright before her mother and with a look of great attention said to go that is the infinitive mode then comes the indicative the present tense of which is i go we go thou goest you go he goes they go now for the past tense i goed thou goest oh mamma exclaimed she that will never do i am sure that goad is wrong what is the past tense indeed mary i shall not tell you you must find it out yourself let me see said mary i should not say that i goad out yesterday but that i went out yesterday but can went be the past time of the verb to go it is indeed mary how very strange mamma went and go are not the least alike 
one is as long again as the other and they have not a single letter the same this shows replied her mother that the verb is irregular that is to say that in its conjugation it does not follow the common rules now go on mary went on with the past tense i went we went thou wentest you went he went they went now comes the future tense i remember the signs of it are shall or will i shall go we shall go thou shalt go you shall go he shall go they shall go i am quite glad to return to the verb to go in the subjunctive and imperative mode said her mother go is also used mary went on i may or might or could go we may go thou mayest go you may go he may go they may go then the imperative mode is let me go let us go go thou go you let him go let them go and lastly the participles are going and gone i was very near saying goad mamma but i recollected just in time if the verb had been regular said her mother the past tense and the passive participle would have been goad for in regular verbs these are always the same and end in ed in the verb to work for instance the past tense is worked and the passive participle is worked also can you find out any regular verb by this method i will try mamma let me see if the verb to write is regular the past is i wrote then it must be irregular because it does not end in ed nor does the participle either said her mother for the participles are writing written in the verb to talk continued mary the past tense is talked now let us see what are the participles talking and talked that will do mamma cried she quite pleased at her success to talk is a regular verb and the verb to learn must be a regular verb also for learned is both past tense and the past participle and the verb to walk is regular also mamma well that will do mary you have found out examples enough to make you remember the rule oh but do let me find out a few irregular verbs she thought a little and then said to give is irregular for the past is gave and the participle given and the verb to feel though i do not know she added for the past is felt and the participle is felt too so they are the same but they do not end in ed said her mother therefore it is irregular the irregular are almost as numerous as the regular verbs but we have had verbs enough to-day mary so put on your bonnet and take a run in the garden the rival friends susan and lucy were two friends who went to the same school every year the scholars were examined by the ladies of the neighborhood who superintended the school and three prizes were given the first was for the best girl in the school the second for the best scholar and the third for her who had attended the school most regularly susan stood no chance of having this last prize for her mother having been ill for some months past she had often been obliged to stay home to assist in the household affairs and to take care of the younger children but she was a girl of such excellent disposition so attentive to her poor sick mother so careful of her brothers and sisters and so kind and good-tempered that every one wished and expected her to gain the first prize lucy was a clever girl she had a remarkably good memory and she understood and took pleasure in what she learnt she wished susan to gain the first prize because she loved her dearly and she felt pretty certain of having the second herself she was ambitious of being thought the cleverest girl in the school and then she knew that it was more easy to outstrip susan in learning than in goodness at length the day of the examination arrived the children were all neatly dressed in their sunday clothes and accompanied by their mothers to the school susan was sadly grieved that her mother was too unwell to go with her but her mother kissed her at parting and said come back susan with the prize you deserve and that will do me more good than all the doctor's physic these words pleased susan because she hoped to gain this prize for though she had a very modest opinion of her own merits her schoolfellows had so often told her that not one of them stood any chance against her that she could not help thinking that they might be right when the children were assembled in the schoolroom they saw the three prizes hung in full view the first was a piece of neat pink and white printed calico for a frock 
the second a straw bonnet trimmed with blue ribbons and the third a shawl of small indian pattern this third prize was to be given first the ladies who superintended the school examined the books and found that eliza hawkins had attended the greatest number of times the prize was therefore given to her accompanied by a few words of praise and she returned to her place much pleased the second prize was to be gained by a trial of skill and as the girls of the lower class had no chance of attaining it exercises of writing and spelling were given to them with some lesser rewards provided for those who performed the task best the beautiful straw bonnet was to be worn by the best scholar of the highest class susan and lucy sat beside each other on the same form in anxious expectation a subject was given them for a theme which they were to write this was the exercise on which lucy felt so sure of success half an hour was allowed them for the task during which time no intercourse was allowed between the children and they were to keep perfect silence the subject was the discovery of america the girls all took up their pens and began cogitating in their minds and ransacking their memories to know what they should write susan wrote all she could recollect about columbus's voyage across unknown seas the danger he ran of being forced by his crew to return of the delight he felt when he first discovered land and the reception he met with from the savages of the new country she had got so far when she heard lucy exclaim in a low whisper what shall i do i can't recollect the man's name oh susan help me susan was astonished she had expected lucy to produce by far the best account of america but poor lucy could do nothing while her mind was confused and bewildered by trying to recollect the name susan in her anxiety to relieve her transgressed the rules of the school she wrote on a small slip of paper christopher columbus and pushed it under the long desk on which they were writing to her companion who eagerly seized it and began writing with great earnestness and went on with such alacrity that though ten minutes of the time allowed was already passed at the end of the half hour not only was her theme ready but it was decidedly superior to any of the others and the prize was given to her mrs staunton one of the ladies put the bonnet on lucy and tied it under her chin all of the children admired the bonnet but without envy they knew that they had not the same claim of it that lucy had and looked pleased to see how well it became her but no one was more sincerely glad of her success than susan though her own theme would have won a prize if lucy had not outdone her lucy's color rose with delight and exultation but when she looked at susan she thought of what she had done for her tears of gratitude stood in her eyes she was impatient for the awarding of the first prize which he now more than ever hoped it would be given to susan the moral conduct of several children then underwent an examination susan was declared to be the best girl of the school and was called up to receive the prize but before she could reach the spot mrs morley arose and motioning with her hand that it should be replaced upon the table said i regret to have anything to say against so good a girl as susan but it is my duty to report what i observed this morning a written paper passed between lucy and susan during the time of the theme they are both to blame for breaking our rules but it was so kind of lucy to assist the only girl who was likely to be her rival that we must excuse her fault besides as lucy's prize relates to learning only this circumstance is unconnected with it but it is otherwise with susan continued she assuming a graver look and unless she can clear herself she cannot deserve the prize of good conduct mrs morley knowing that lucy was the better scholar than susan had been led into the error of supposing that the paper she had seen pass between them came from lucy instead of having it been given to her during mrs morley's speech lucy's color came and went she breathed hard and at length burst into tears susan on the contrary heard the accusation with composure and determined not to disclose a secret which would deprive lucy of her triumph she therefore looked down but made no answer every one admired the warmth of feeling which lucy showed for her friend and were surprised and almost shocked at the indifference and silence of the latter susan had some hope it is true that lucy would come forward and reveal the truth but though lucy dearly loved her friend she had not courage in the moment of victory to clear her at her own expense 
and therefore contented herself with grieving for her but without speaking foolish girl she little thought how much her character would have risen if she had at once done justice to susan and how utterly despised she would be if the truth should be discovered in any other manner susan's silence was considered as an admission of her guilt and the prize of good conduct was given to another girl lucy could contain her feelings no longer she went up to susan kissed her with warmth and tenderness took the bonnet off her own head and put it on her friend saying it is yours susan but susan disclaimed it mrs staunton thought that lucy carried her grief for the disappointment of her friend too far her fault is not great she said and i regret that occurring at this moment it should deprive her of the prize how much more bitter susan's feelings would have been if by the assistance you gave her had deprived you of the prize these words instead of consoling lucy did but increase her grief for it was she that felt the bitter remorse which mrs staunton spoke of she hung upon susan's neck in an agony of grief susan whispered to her speak out lucy and it will be all over i say so as much for your sake as for my own i cannot replied lucy i dare not face such shame but do you speak for me and then dreading to hear what susan would say she ran out of the schoolroom poor susan knew not what to do if lucy had herself confessed the truth it would have atoned for her conduct but for susan to make the disclosure would be far from producing the same effect besides it might appear as if she were taking advantage of lucy's absence to clear herself at the expense of her friend she determined therefore to say nothing and distressed by the look of wonder and disappointment which was fixed on her by all present she begged to leave to go home her tears which had hitherto restrained fell in abundance when she beheld her mother's pale countenance and knew that she had brought back nothing to do her good but this was not the case for no sooner had she told all that had passed than her mother's anxious look was changed into a cheerful smile she kissed susan and told her that she doubly deserved the prize and that it was better than bringing it home besides she said i am sure that when lucy knows that you have not spoken for her she will speak out for herself oh but you will keep my secret dear mother said susan yes replied her mother whatever you can find in me i consider as sacred susan's mother was right in her conjecture as they were sitting on the porch of the farmhouse in the evening they saw lucy and her mother approach lucy had persuaded her mother not to go until it was nearly dark that her shame might be less observed and even then she slunk behind her mother as they drew near the house lucy has come said her mother to ask susan's forgiveness and to learn what passed at the school when her fault was known her fault is not known said susan i could not betray her lucy felt all of susan's kindness but she dreaded the thoughts of having to make an avowal herself her mother insisted on it being done publicly all those she said who saw her false glory must witness her shame it is the only way she can atone for her conduct the next day at the meeting of the sunday school before church lucy confessed her fault and told everything that had passed susan instead of triumphing in her innocence looked so bashful that you might almost have supposed it was she who had done wrong while lucy's courage revived as she saw the pleasure that susan's vindication gave to every one and when she came to tell how firmly susan had resisted every temptation to betray her she seemed to forget herself in the warmth of her feelings for her friend but if susan rose higher than ever in the good opinion of all lucy by the frankness of her confession regained their confidence and instead of the shame and confusion by which she expected to be overwhelmed she found her mind relieved from a heavy weight the little girl who had received the prize of good conduct now came up and put it in susan's hand but susan would not take it and mrs staunton desired the child to keep it saying susan has gained the affection and approbation of every one she wants no other reward oh but she must have the straw bonnet said lucy with earnestness indeed indeed she must and she put it on her head and tied it so tight that susan could not undo the knot susan looked distressed but mrs staunton said you cannot susan refuse to give lucy the pleasure of seeing you wear it End of chapter eighteen
Chapter 19 of Mary's Grammar by Jane Marset. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Jennifer Dahlman. Continuation of Verbs, Lesson 13, Auxiliary Verbs. There are several little verbs which are called auxiliary verbs or helping verbs because they assist us in the conjugation of other verbs. Do you mean the little verbs may, might, should, would, could, which are so much used in the subjunctive mode, said Mary? Yes, replied her mother, and also the verbs shall and will, which you know are used in the future tense, and let, which is the sign of the imperative mode. In short, whenever a verb helps you to conjugate another verb, it is called an auxiliary verb. And what are the other verbs called, Mamma? They are distinguished by the name of principal verbs. Well, they deserve that title, said Mary, for they are of much more consequence than the little bits of helping verbs. There are, however, replied her mother, two auxiliary verbs of very great importance, to have and to be. They are both so irregular that it is necessary you should learn the conjugation of each of them by heart. Let us begin with the verb to have infinitive mode to have indicative mode present time singular first person i have plural we have second person singular thou hast plural you have third person singular he she or it has or hath plural they have past time first person singular i had plural we had second person singular thou hadst plural you had third person singular he she or it had plural they had future time first person singular i shall or will have plural we shall or will have second person singular thou shalt or wilt have plural you shall or will have third person singular he she or it shall or will have plural they shall or will have subjunctive mode if i have or may might would could or should have if thou have or may might would could or should have if he she or it have or may might would could or should have if we have or may might would could or should have if you have or may might would could or should have if they have or may might could would or should have imperative mode let me have let us have have thou have you let him her or it have let them have participles active having passive had but what does to have mean mamma all by itself as it is in a conjunction i can understand what to have spoken or to have slept or to have a cold means but to have all alone seems nonsense. To have all alone, as you call it, Mary, that is to say, when it is not followed by another verb, cannot be an auxiliary verb. No, to be sure, said Mary, laughing, it cannot help us to conjugate another verb if there is no other to conjugate. Therefore, when the verb to have is conjugated by itself, it becomes a principal verb, and means possession, that is to say, that you have something then you should say what it is you have said mary else have is nonsense at least added she colouring at her own presumption i cannot understand it well then we must think of something you possess your workbox for instance and you may say i have a workbox oh cried mary you mean something that belongs to me something that is mine yes but you also may possess something that does not belong to you and is not yours if a thief steal a purse of money he is possessed of it though it certainly does not belong to him and when sophie left me her doll to take care of when she went to aunt howard's i had possession of it though it did not belong to me for you know she did not give it to me mamma she only lent it i understand it very well continued she to have means when you have something whether it belongs to you or not as i have sophie's doll you have a carriage he has a horse yes said her mother the nouns doll carriage and horse are things possessed so you see that 
when to have is a principal verb a noun follows to tell you what is the thing possessed but when to have is used as a helping verb instead of being followed by a noun it is followed by another verb which it helps to conjugate let us find some examples i have a book which amuses me and i have read it all through i have a book said mary means that you possess the book and have is there a principal verb meaning possession but to have read it is quite a different thing for here have instead of being a principal verb and possessing anything becomes a mere help to the verb to read so you see mary that in one case something is possessed and in another something is done oh yes we possess the noun and we do the verb that will be a good way to find out whether have is a principal or an auxiliary verb when something is possessed it is a principal when something is done it is an auxiliary verb yet mamma i have just thought of a sentence that puzzles me suppose that i say i have bought a doll does have belong to the verb bought or to the noun doll to the verb bought said her mother which immediately follows it if you said i have a doll then the verb to have would become a principal verb and the doll the thing possessed now can you tell me mary what part of a principal verb is used when you conjugate it with an auxiliary verb no indeed i do not know replied mary it is the participle rejoined her mother and when you say i have spoken to have slept to have danced you mention the participle of those verbs without thinking of it so i do exclaimed mary how much grammar i knew before i began to learn it mamma i will now write down said her mother the present tense of the verb to have spoken i have spoken we have spoken thou hast spoken you have spoken he has spoken they have spoken it is unnecessary for me to go any further for you have only to add the passive participle to the verb to have throughout the conjugation but does the participle spoken never change mamma no my dear why should it it is the business of the helping verb to save it that trouble the auxiliary verb marks all the changes of time as i have spoken i had spoken i shall have spoken so the principal verb sits at his ease without change of place or posture and is waited upon by the helping verb grammarians by means of the verb to have contrive to make out several tenses in the conjugation of the principal verb how can you make out more than three tenses exclaimed mary it seems to me impossible for you know the present tense that is now stands in the middle and all that goes before now is past time and all that comes after now is future time yesterday and last week and last year is past time and tomorrow and next week and next year is future time the past and the future time are very long are they not mary oh yes i cannot tell how long for i do not know either when they begin or end the past time begins i suppose from the beginning of the world at least said her mother we know nothing of the time that was before the world was created well i think that's quite long enough said mary and then the future time will that be the end of the world oh no longer still for i remember that you said the future time would last forever how odd it is that whilst the past and the future time are so long the present time should be so short should only be just this instant and now continued she after a pause it is gone and where is it gone to mary oh i am sure mamma that is more than i can tell it is gone by and past so it is become past time ah so it is to be sure said mary smiling at the discovery and pleased to see that the present time which appeared to her so short was not utterly lost and so there is no present time now mary oh yes there must always be a present time while one is saying or doing anything 
than if there is always a present time said her mother i should think the present time as long as either of the others indeed so it is mamma i did not think of that for though the present time goes away in an instant another follows the next instant and so it always lasts it is made up of instances following each other you know that every instant of past time must have been present time before it passed by and became past time to be sure said mary and every instant of the time to come that is the future time will become present time some day or other and then when it has passed the instant of being present time it will then become past time i think mamma added she laughing time goes backwards like a crab mamma smiled at mary's comparison it is true she said we look forward to the future time and when it comes up to us and passes the crucial moment now we look back upon it as the past time well mary when we began this discussion on time i was telling you that grammarians divide the past and the future into several parts by the help of the verb to have and i said mamma that i could not understand how that could be done for when once the time has passed it can be no other than the past time certainly but it may be past a little while or a long while it may be past longer ago than something else that has been done since if i say i wrote to my brother i know that is the past tense but if i say i had written to my brother before i received his letter you know that my writing was longer ago than my receiving his letter oh yes now i understand it said mary i had written means i had written before something else was done the future tense resumed her mother may be divided into parts in the same manner i shall write means that i intend to write some time or other without naming the period but if i say i shall have written before you set out it means that i shall write sooner than another event takes place that is you setting out but these compound tenses are too difficult to be learnt at your age mary i merely point them out to show you that you will have something more to learn respecting verbs hereafter continuation of verbs lesson fourteen the verb to be we will begin to-day mary said her mother with the conjugation of the verb to be infinitive mode to be indicative mode present time singular first person i am plural we are second person singular thou art plural you are third person singular he she or it is plural they are past time first person singular i was plural we were second person singular thou wast plural you were third person singular he she or it was plural they were future time first person singular i shall or will be plural we shall or will be second person singular thou shalt or wilt be plural you shall or will be third person singular he she or it shall or will be plural they shall or will be subjunctive mode present time if i be or may might would could or should be if thou be may might would could or should be if he she or it may might would could or should be if we be or may might would could or should be if you be or may might would could or should be if they be or may might would could or should be past time if i were if thou wert if he she or it were if we were if you were if they were imperative mode let me be let us be be thou be you let him her or it be let them be participles present being past been how very irregular this verb is cried mary who would ever guess that i am thou art he is we are you are they are was the present tense of the verb to be if it were conjugated i be thou beest he bees as it ought to be there would be some sense in it but the sound exclaimed her mother putting her hands to her ears 
i cannot bear the buzzing of your bees mary oh you need not be frightened returned mary carrying on the joke my bees will not sting you mamma then the past tense continued she i was thou wast he was is unlike the verb to be as possible it is very true my dear it is difficult to discover that you are conjugating the verb to be till you come to the future tense which is regular i shall be thou shalt be etc then mamma there is the past tense in the subjunctive mode if i were if thou wert if he were quite unlike again but the imperative mode said her mother which finishes the conjugation is regular if you get the verb perfectly by heart you will no longer be perplexed with its irregularities well this tiresome little verb to be said mary is the most difficult of all to understand it is called a helping verb but i think it only helps to puzzle one for i really do not know what it means to be like to have might be conjugated by itself as i have just repeated it to you it is then a principal verb which means to exist but what is to exist inquired mary is it to be alive people differ in their explanation of the word to exist said her mother but it appears to me that whatever is exists whether it be alive or not that rock lying yonder mary exists as well as you or i though in a very different state of existence certainly yes indeed cried mary i should not like to exist like that great stone at all not to be able to feel nor to move nor even to be moved she added it is so large it is true mary that your existence has every advantage over that of the stone except that it will in all probability last longer in its present state than you will in yours that rock has been there as long as i can remember and may remain there not only during your life but for years after mary seemed rather surprised at the stone having any advantage over her and exclaimed well but after all well but after all there is no pleasure in existing in that manner without feeling that i grant you said her mother but let us return to the verb to be if you add a noun to it to point out the particular state of existence it will be easier to understand i am by itself is rather puzzling at your age i must confess but if you add the noun child and say i am a child the meaning is quite clear thus you may say she is a woman he is a man they are soldiers we are musicians oh yes said mary the verb to be is easy enough to understand when a noun is added to it and so is the verb to have mamma don't you remember how easy it was when we added a noun to it as i have a horse he has a coat but when you say i am a child or you are a woman that does not mean to possess something as the verb to have does when you add a noun to it no certainly replied her mother else the two verbs would have the same meaning and one of them would be useless the verb to have when used as a principal verb means possession and the verb to be used as a principal verb means existence now if you add a noun to the verb to have it shows what it is you possess and if you add a noun to the verb to be it points out how or in what state you exist that is to say what you are cried mary whether a man or a woman or that stone there mamma that we have been talking about only she added it cannot speak and say i am a stone no but you may speak of it in the third person mary and say that is a stone an adjective also frequently points out the state of existence as he is happy they are wise we are good when the verb to be is conjugated as an auxiliary verb said mary i suppose the passive participle of the principal verb is added to it as it is with the verb to have oh no it cannot be so said she interrupting herself you cannot say i am danced i was danced 
you cannot say so it is true mary because you are rather too big to be danced in your nurse's arms but sophie is danced and if she could conjugate a verb she might say to other children of her own age i am danced you are danced she is danced we are danced and so on after mary laughed heartily at the idea of her little sister sophie conjugating a verb in her nurse's arms her mother continued and which participle would you use for yourself mary who can dance all alone oh i have found it out mamma it is the active participle dancing i am dancing thou art dancing he is dancing and as she repeated the verb she held out her frock and began practicing the last new dance steps her dancing master had taught her look mamma she said how clever i am taking two lessons at once you see therefore mary that you may use both the active and passive participles with the verb to be while you can only use the passive with the verb to have then mamma said mary the passive participle has two helping verbs to wait upon it whilst the active participle has only one that is not fair oh said her mother the active participle is such a busybody that it requires less assistance now mary find out some examples of the verb to be conjugated with the active participle of the principal verb i am writing you are talking they are fighting said mary that will do replied her mother now for some examples with the passive participle mary reflected a little and then said i am forgotten you are forgiven it is broken very well mary but these participles all belong to irregular verbs give me an example with a passive participle of a regular verb which you know always ends in ed mary considered for some little time before she could think of one then several were all at once recalled to her memory and she repeated in quick succession i am pleased you are caressed she is scolded they are admired but mamma she cried interrupting herself these are all passive verbs i remember that you explained them to me before you are quite right my dear when i taught you the meaning of a passive verb i said that instead of doing anything yourself something was done to you this it is true was an explanation suited to your capacity when you first began grammar but now that you have made some little progress in it i may tell you that a passive verb consists of a passive participle conjugated with the auxiliary verb to be this verb to be you know indicates a state of existence and forms an essential part of a passive verb an active verb may be conjugated without any auxiliary or it may be conjugated with the auxiliary verb to have as i have loved but the passive verb cannot be conjugated without the verb to be you see therefore mary of what importance this little verb is which you thought so insignificant indeed i beg its pardon said mary joining her hands in an attitude of supplication i hope it will be pleased to forgive me the passive participle been continued her mother may be used as a principal verb and then it is conjugated with the auxiliary to have as i have been thou hast been etc we may now i think take leave of the verbs but before you go let me ask you whether you recollect the different sorts of verbs which i taught you in our first conversation on verbs what is a verb active it is a verb answered mary in which not only an action is performed but that action must be done by some object as i stroke the cat i eat an apple and a passive verb it is one that the nominative is acted upon whilst itself remains passive as i am beaten but mamma there is one thing i cannot well understand in the passive verb the nominative is the object acted upon so the nominative ought to be in the objective case no the object acted upon is not always in the objective case nor is the agent always in the nominative case 
if you say i am beaten you must be beaten by somebody or something suppose that you are beaten by sophie she is the active person yet she is not in the nominative case in what case is she sophie must be in the objective case replied mary and now i recollect mamma your saying that whenever a noun is preceded by a preposition it is in the objective case so when i say that i am beaten by sophie the preposition by makes sophie objective you are quite right and you will be convinced of this at once if you put a pronoun in the place of sophie you would not put the nominative she and say i am beaten by she but you would put the objective pronoun her and say i am beaten by her now tell me what is a verb neuter it is one in which the action does not pass over to any object as i sleep i walk and what is the principal verb it is one that may be conjugated without the aid of an auxiliary verb you are not quite correct mary said her mother for all verbs require the assistance of some little auxiliary verb in their conjugation let in the imperative mode shall and will in the future tense and the verbs used in the subjunctive mode to express uncertainty such as may should could are all auxiliary verbs you would define a principal verb more accurately if you said that it is one which is conjugated without the help of the auxiliary verb to have or to be now what is an auxiliary verb any verb which assists in the conjugation of a principal verb lastly what are participles they are two words belonging to a principal verb and they are called participles because they partake of the adjective and of the verb when used as a verb they must be conjugated with the auxiliary verb to have or to be i am very glad to find you remember what you have learnt so well i have no further remarks to make on any other parts of speech so i believe mary that we may now conclude our lessons till you are old enough to learn syntax a branch of grammar which requires more sense and reflection than children have at your age but since there are no more parts of speech to learn mamma what can syntax be it teaches you replied her mother how to place the several parts of speech in their proper places when you speak or write in short it teaches you to speak and write correctly but mamma said mary i am sure you will not finish without a story no replied her mother i have prepared one for the conclusion which i think will make you laugh mary's curiosity was strongly excited but she was obliged to wait till the next day when her mother told her the following story sheep stealing a poor laboring man was taken up for stealing sheep he was carried before the justice who inquired his name and what he had to say in his defence my name is noun he replied i am a hard-working man i never stole a sheep or anything else in my life but as the people who brought him before the magistrate declared that they had seen him secretly carrying away a sheep the justice committed him to prison and he was locked up in a cell with nothing to eat but a loaf of bread or to drink but a jug of water while he was sitting there lamenting his hard fate he heard the jailer with his large jingling bunch of keys unlock the door and who should come in but his old and dear friend pronoun they embraced affectionately and pronoun told him that he could by no means think of letting him remain in that dark dismal place i should most heartily glad to be out of it replied noun but it is impossible for i am kept locked up i am come on purpose to take your place said his friend you must go home to your wife and children and let me remain here in your stead noun was very grateful for pronoun's kind intention it is not the first time my good friend he said that you have answered for me in times of need but i can by no means consent to your being shut up in my place mary who now first discovered that the personages of the tale represented the parts of speech was very much diverted oh that is excellent she cried pronoun wants to take the place of noun as it does in the grammar well go on mamma added she impatient to hear how the parts of speech would figure in the story besides continued her mother noun said that the jailer would never allow of the exchange 
as for that replied pronoun we are so much alike that we have frequently been taken for each other the old purblind jailer would never be able to distinguish you from me nay i dare say that if i was to stand trial in your place i doubt whether the judge would either yes said mary a noun and a pronoun are so very much alike and then suppose that you were to be transported instead of me continued noun i am to undergo an examination to-morrow morning and though i am innocent if the people who arrested me swear against me i may be condemned well even if it should be so replied pronoun it is better that i should be sent across the seas than you i have neither wife nor children to grieve for me the mention of his wife and children brought tears into the eyes of noun ah oh, my poor wife said he with a sigh when she hears of the news her exclamations will never cease i will accept your kind offer to replace me for an hour or two in order to run home and embrace her and my children it was so settled and when the jailer opened the door to let out pronoun noun slipped out in his stead without any notice being taken by the jailer when noun approached his cottage he heard sad wailings and lamentations his wife who was a weak hysterical woman had just heard of his arrest and she was wringing her hands and exclaiming oh woe is me alas what will become of us oh my dear helpless children she was sobbing and crying in this manner when noun entered the house her sorrow was then instantly turned into joy and she exclaimed ah my dearest husband oh is it really you bless me what happiness oh i am sure i know the wife's name said mary it is interjection but go on mamma i am so impatient to hear what follows her mother proceeded noun embraced her with tenderness and stretched out his arms to his little children who ran up to him one climbed on the back of his chair and hung upon his neck another crawled all up his knees the baby cried to be fondled in his arms and one little chubby fellow crept under his chair and sat there quite pleased like a bird in a cage but what were the children's names inquired mary oh that i leave to your discernment to discover what did they do why one crawled up on his father's knees another climbed on the back of his chair oh now i guess she said quite delighted at the discovery up upon in under are prepositions so the little children were all prepositions you have guessed rightly said her mother and then went on with her story thus the neighbors of noun no sooner heard of his return than they flocked to his house the first that came were the adjectives who lived very near and after them the adverbs who were not much farther off when they heard that noun was to return to prison and to be more fully examined the following day they all promised to be there to speak of his character oh i am sure said mary that the adjectives will say he was a good sort of man and the adverbs speak well of him too his wife continued her mother filled a basket with the best provisions her cottage contained and before the hour had expired he took a tender leave of her and his children and returned to the prison when he reached it he asked to see his friend the jailer let him in and soon after let out pronoun without distinguishing one from the other the next morning noun was again taken before the justice the room was full of people some who came out of curiosity and others who were his friends and came to give evidence in his favor the witnesses were now called and examined the justice asked the first what was his name and ordered him to tell all that he knew of the theft my name is verb replied the witness i am a farmer and i was hard at work ploughing when i saw noun come slyly up behind the hedge under the shade of which several of my sheep were resting he seized hold of one of them and was making off with it thinking as the hedge was pretty high that i could not see him upon this i hallooed out in my imperative mode let go the sheep you rogue he no sooner heard my voice 
Then he dropped the sheep and took to his heels. I could not leave my team to follow him, so I sent my two boys, good clever lads, who were helping me at the plow, after him, to try to secure him, or at least find out who he was. Mary laughed heartily at the idea of Farmer Verb speaking in the imperative mode, and said, Oh, the boys were the two helping verbs, to have and to be. The two little verbs were then called in to give their evidence. They looked at Noun and declared he was the man whom they had been sent after. The eldest, who was a strong active lad, was then told to give an account of what had passed. He said, when my father saw the fellow running away, he cried out, Have at him, boys. We set off at full speed and gained so much upon him that I thought it would be an easy matter to have him. Indeed, I once caught hold of the skirt of his coat and called out to Toby, who was some way behind. I have him. But he gave a sudden jerk and got away, just when I thought I had him sure. Well, said I, I shall have him again presently and I should have had him before, if my foot had not slipped just as I came up with him. However, I would not give up the chase. I may have him yet, said I, and I might have had him if he had not turned into a wood and hid himself among the trees. So then I sat down and waited for Toby, who had a hard matter to keep up with me and wanted a moment's rest, and having taken breath, I had a mind to be after him again, but the rogue had made clear off. Mary could not refrain from laughing. I declare, said she, he has gone through the whole of the verb to have, in the first person, participles and all. I wonder whether Toby will do as much. I think one conjugation is enough, replied her mother. Toby, you know, is more a quiet sort of lad. In his evidence, he said that the following morning he met Noun going to his work, then he set up a you and cry of stop thief and got him arrested poor noun had nothing to say in his defense but that he was innocent if you did not attempt to steal the sheep said the justice where were you at that hour i was at work all that morning in the meadow by the riverside that is the very meadow the sheep was taken said farmer verb so it's likely enough you left your work to steal it all this testimony went sadly against poor noun and the justice began to think he must be guilty when his friends the adjectives came forward and declared that he was an honest industrious religious and well-meaning man quite incapable of committing a theft i told you that they would give him a good character mamma said mary i am sure the justice ought not to condemn him a justice does not condemn a man replied her mother he only examines him and if the evidence gives him reason to think the accused guilty he commits him to prison to take his trial at the next assizes that is when the judges go to their circuits to try prisoners well but now go on mamma i am so impatient to know the end the adverbs continued her mother were still warmer in the praises of noun they seemed to think that his neighbors the adjectives did not say enough in his favor for every time one of them spoke of his honesty or his industry they cried out most remarkably honest uncommonly industrious the very kindest of fathers and of husbands oh the dear adverbs cried mary how good they are the justice was strangely perplexed at such contradictory evidence. He was quite at a loss how to decide, when a noise was heard without, and exclamations of, Bring him in! Here is the thief! We have got hold of the rogue at last! The new prisoner hung back, and struggled hard to get away. However, he was forced into court, and he had no sooner made his appearance than every one was struck with his remarkable likeness to noun this man must surely be your brother said the justice to noun no please your worship answered he it is true that he is my relative but only in a distant degree the justice then inquired the man's name and he replied pronoun he was not the same pronoun who so kindly offered to remain in prison instead of his friend noun said mary i am sure 
no replied her mother the pronouns you know are a very numerous family and he was of another branch the constable who had arrested him whispered to the justice that he had long known the prisoner and always considered him as a very suspicious character for that he went by different names according as it suited his purpose or situation that he sometimes called himself relative pronoun at others demonstrative pronoun and at others conjunction but to my certain knowledge said the jailer his name is that the adjectives who also knew the man came forward and assured the justice that he was a good-for-nothing fellow idle and prolificate and the adverbs confirmed whatever the adjective said farmer verb who had felt so confident of the guilt of noun now began to think himself in the wrong he owned that he believed that he had been deceived by the resemblance and had taken noun for pronoun he asked his sons which of the two was the man they had pursued they hung down their heads they knew not what to answer the justice then arose and after having summed up the evidence i will show you the culprit stretching out his arm and pointing at the new prisoner that is the man pronoun struck with the astonishment that the justice to whom he was a stranger should know his real name thought his guilt fully discovered he fell on his knees confessed his crime and begged for mercy the justice said that it did not depend on him either to condemn or to pardon him that he must be confined to prison to take his trial at the next assizes the friends of noun determined to conduct him home in triumph accordingly a procession was arranged two heralds preceded noun bearing banners on one of which was inscribed this is a man whom no calamity could injure and on the other this is the man who has been so honorably acquitted well i cannot conceive who the heralds can be said mary what is it that goes before a noun mary an article replied the child oh then the two heralds were the two articles a and the and so it was written on their banner pronoun the personal friend of noun not his roguish relative followed and then came the adjectives and adverbs walking in pairs and talking in praise of noun all the way they went farmer verb and his sons followed at a respectful distance being ashamed of the error into which they had fallen and a band of music brought up the rear the crowd of people was so great and the streets through which the procession had to pass so narrow that it often came to a stop and they would have found it difficult to proceed had it not been for the assistance of some constables who had been appointed to close the ranks when they were broken and to separate those who thronged too closely together those i think must be the conjunctions that serve both to separate the sentences and to join them together you are right said her mother but then mamma the conjunctions i mean the constables could only separate the crowd or join the ranks when they came to a little stop for do you not know that the conjunctions cannot interfere when they come to a full stop they did not come to a full stop my dear till they reached the house of noun when his children hearing the sound of music came out to see what it was they then ran back to say it was their father coming home with a crowd of people his wife rushed out and fell into her husband's arms uttering exclamations of joy the little ones clung around the spectators of this happy scene gave three loud cheers and thus my tale is ended. The End End of Mary's Grammar, interspersed with stories and intended for the use of children, by Jane Marset. Read by Jennifer Dahlman.